right, everybody. Oh, and they're off. <laughs> Cheers, and welcome to another Friday night Cleveland Moto Corona cast. Brought to you by Bell's Overrun. Oh. And to my left is... Uh, we don't know. We don't know. We, we haven't fucking perfected that yet. No. Because it changes. Yeah. So in the Mighty right. Mac. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, John. <laughs> <laughs> and to my left. <laughs> Chris Smith. Chris you know. Smith. Hi, Chris. Chris Smith. <laughs> <laughs> and to his left. Just the Oscar. Final question. Oscar. Can get it. It's about pilots and machines. <laughs> Hi, Oscar. And Oscar's left? Steve Hoffert. Oh. Hi, Steve. <laughs> uh, Steve's left? Nick. Nick DeVito. Oh, Nick shit. DeVito. And to Nick DeVito's left. <laughs> Sorry, Nick. <laughs> it's right there. All right, Kropke, you. All right, okay. Thank you. Dan Kropke. <laughs> and to Dan's left. <laughs> I think at that point that would be me. And then we have our two wonderfully special guests. Two special guests. Yeah. Please introduce yourself. We will start with Little Miss Strumpet. Who are you and where are you from? <laughs> Hello, darling. This is Miss Emma from Motorcycles and Misfits here in sunny, not Santa Cruz, but Monterey, California. Excellent. Just getting pissed at me, so I don't. And, and then I don't want to get involved. Edition is our, our good buddy who is now my hero because he works at Ryan Guy's Brewery, which is one of my favorite breweries. Dan, how are you, Dan? Doing good. How are you guys this evening? Good to see you, Dan. Hey, what's up, Phil? So uh, I just wanted to give everyone the uh, the new fashion accessory. Here's the new fashion accessory that said, I survived Porco spring break. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man, I knew I was. So, uh, so yeah, due to the fact that, you know, so many of the people that I love in my life are, you know, live a life behind bars in the good way. Um, yeah. So all these guys that I know and love aren't working right now. So um, you can throw down the, the equivalent of a, a tip on two or three drinks and get yourself a I survived, I survived a spring break Corona approved Porco attire. Um, so fantastic. And uh, that's uh, Dan Watson. So our, one of our favorite bartenders uh, at Dan Watson 19, we'll tag it in there, but it's just, people are coming up with creative ways to try to, you know, keep the rent paid. And uh, we want to support anybody in their efforts to do that. So I got to tell you, Phil, you have the greatest bars in Cleveland. They're <laughs> wonderful. We personally, I, you know, I would probably, I wouldn't leave a bar. If I ever moved to Cleveland, I probably wouldn't leave a bar. It'd be the easiest thing in the world. That's, you know? that's one of the things that we have that probably a lot of cities don't have is a good old school drinking bar. Yes. You go there and for a couple bucks, you can get a beer and you can stay there all day and all night if you want and walk home with still money in your pocket. Walk home, darling. It's easy to do. Walk home? Well, Surely you mean crawl home on hands and knees. Hey, we're a bunch of alcoholics here, so we don't crawl because, you know, <laughs> we're on autopilot. You okay, know, for all good. the people that didn't think that they were alcoholics, and I have a lot of friends that said, you know, I'm not an alcoholic. I'm true. I'm, I'm not addicted to alcohol. It took about eight, nine days into this Corona thing for people to start oh. going, no, I need a fucking drink, you know? And uh, it's, it was, it wasn't like there was this, like, I think I'd like a drink. It was very much like, no, I, I didn't need, you know, I need a fucking drink. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, yeah. So it's a, so it is a tough thing. So how did you land that gig at Rheingeist, Dan? Man, I just saw it online and, uh, applied and it, it's a warehouse job. So it's just yeah. driving around on forklifts, pick up, put down, wash, rinse, repeat. But you know, they've, they've got quite a few benefits that are, you know, come in liquid form. <laughs> so tell us, so, so Dan mailed us a couple of beers, but I should clarify when I tell you that Dan mailed us a couple of beers, you'd think, well, okay, what the fuck, you know, you mailed us a couple of beers. Tell us about the beers you mailed us. Well, I'm actually drinking one myself tonight. Um, this is called a double oaked, a bog beast is bog a beast. wheat wine, wheat wine that has been aged for 13 months in bourbon barrels. And then the last two months of it live 
um, lived in scotch barrels. So huge shot of uh, that peaty, smoky scotch flavor at the end. Um, and it's coming in at, I think, about 12 and a half percent. Yep. Something Somewhere like around that. there. It's fantastic. How is a wheat I, wine different, different than a barley wine? I think it all depends on what you're using as your mash. Right. It, it's, it has to be 51% or more wheat. Okay. Well, there you go. As opposed to barley. You didn't know right. that's too easy um, of an answer, I was, Kramke. Come on. Yeah, he's a brewmaster. I was mistaken earlier. I mistakenly called that beer uh, Knob Goblin earlier, <laughs> and uh, it turns out it wasn't no, Knob Goblin. Else. <laughs> no, that is something else, Phil. That is something else completely that has nothing to do with beer. I, again, the after beer, but not. I stand no. corrected. <laughs> no goblin! Oh my god! So, and you know, and if you've had a, if you've ever had a knob goblin at about fourteen percent, it's it's one you don't soon forget. No, <laughs> I, I guess that's better than a knob gobbler. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. That's, that's called edging, isn't it? Where you only get about fourteen percent. I mean, I want to knob gobble on it. At least ninety percent, you know, like uh, I, I'm you, gonna, yeah. Yeah. proper. Yeah, I've never been a knob goblin without whiskey, so I, I don't. <laughs> just saying. All right. wah, wah. Oh, a whiskey knob goblin. All right, all right. It failed. That's fine. Moving on. <laughs> so moving on. Uh, interesting oh, thing. Uh, I've I've noticed that recently there's been a. A rash of people coming around the shop that are very, very interested in these 70s, uh, 70s small displacement two strokes. Um, and this, this is the funniest thing, because about five years ago, six years ago, I couldn't get these things out of my fucking shop. I'd have to spray for them like termites. And. Nobody wanted. I had the uh, I had the Yamaha RD80 hanging around. I couldn't get rid of the damn thing. I had a Kawasaki S3. I couldn't fucking get rid of the goddamn thing. Um, wow. They were there and they were cool, and everyone marveled about how cool and neat they were. But I couldn't get anyone to come off their fucking wallet to save my life, despite everyone having a story about what an amazing vehicle it was or whatever. Nobody would fucking part with money. But I've seen. A lot of them come up in the past, like three weeks. Daniel, which one did you buy? I bought the um, Yamaha CS5, 1972. Okay. So the CS5, that's going to be, um, that's the three port. Is that the three port? Five, five, port. five port. It's That's the true five port, hence the CS5, right? Yep. The CS3 the is the one that you used port. to. CS3 is, is a three port. CS5 is a five port. Right. Makes perfect sense. Logic makes sense. Um, is this one of those deals, though, where a lot of bikes, when they went from a three port to a five port, essentially what they did was they kind of made the transfer ports a tiny bit bigger and just like bridged them and then called it five ports. Anybody got any background on that? Yes. I mean, I, I had my motor apart and when you the pistons in it are super weird looking. They have actual windows cut in the side of the piston so mm -hmm. it is actually like a five port pr proper five port motor mm -hmm. and like it's hard to even explain it but there's like two there's a main transfer port and then two ports on either side that go through come up through windows in the pistons and it it was a really kind of weird setup and yeah the, and the pistons were hard to find you know because they were only used for that year and i think the later rd 200 which is right. you know the revel version of that didn't use that whole setup it was a neat motor it, it didn't have you know being a, a port induction motor it didn't have like the low end or, or like something with a rotary valve or a reed valve but i think that yes i had that <laughs> but i think that cs5 the, with the five port on the top end it just would go berserk like right up you know, you'd hit about five or six grand and it would just be like, and it, it would stand up in like first and second gear. It was a really light bike for being a two stroke, two cylinder, 200 cc. So it had a top speed of, you know, listed at 80 mile an hour. Right. 21 horsepower. Yeah, 21 horsepower out of that one. And funnily enough, that bike was very popular in Britain as well. I mean, it, it, was, it was great for people who were a little bit smaller 
because it was it, okay. it looked very similar to the 250, mm -hmm. but it was just in like three quarter scale. Right. And of course, it, it, it had an electric start, which is great. Right. Yeah. It's it a, had that Dyna starter. It's a baby R5, like the R5. Yeah, basically. Yeah. And yeah. the styling uh, cues. I mean, Yamaha were very, very into their styling cues in the early 70s. So there was very much a corporate look for all of the all of the Yamahas. You could tell immediately what they were just by looking at them. We have another. And I thought it was I thought it was super cool that the what you got going on, Steve. We have another guest. What? Oh, 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 oh. Hey, Jackie. Hey. <laughs> hey, everybody. This is my friend, Jackie Van Ham. That is what? Jackie Van Ham. That's Hello, Jackie Van Ham. Everybody. Hello. Hello. Hello, interwebs. How are you? Hello, internet. <laughs> you caught us, uh, Jackie, when you wanted to be talking about ancient two strokes. Well, 70s two strokes. <laughs> I love that that qualifies as ancient, though. That's amazing. <laughs> what, what kind of ancient two-strokes were you all talking about? Oh, right now we're talking about uh, the, uh, well, we just started talking about, like, bikes, like the old 200cc Yamahas and uh, your C3s and C5s and the early 70s, so 72, 73, the pre-RDs. Gotcha. Yep. Jackie, don't, didn't you have an Elsnore the one year at Mid-Ohio, or were you just borrowing that? Good work, my friend. Good memory. Nope, I do have. I've got a little CR125, a little, a little mini baby Elsinore, which I love to death. It's a total hoot. It makes a ton of noise and smoke, and is just a riot, and I love it, and it's a super, super good time. That was, I think that was technically, technically my first two-stroke. Is that right? I guess maybe I guess maybe that is technically my first two stroke, and then I just picked up um, a year or two ago a 1977 Simpson Schwalbe, which is a East German. Oh, no, say that's good. <laughs> yeah, say yeah, that super, again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Super obscure, super weird German. It has all of it checked all of my boxes of things that I needed to add to my garage. Yeah, so it's good. It is the it is the scooter version of the Triumph bathtub uh, Bonneville type. Bikes. They're, the Schwalbas are just that extraordinarily Eastern block. Yeah. Yes. So, it, it, is, it is the scoot for the people. Um, Emma, you and there's. Stop busting my Schwalbas. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> exactly. So before, uh, before Jackie popped in, Emma, you had. Did you start with a, a small two stroke? Was that one of your first bikes? Yes. Yeah, I started with a Kawasaki S1C. That's which one is C. the smallest, which is the smallest of the triples, which is basically it's a noise making machine. It's got <laughs> no power at all, um, but it makes a lot of noise and they sound great. Um, and of course, me being young and stupid, I put a three into one on it, which made it even noisier, but it gave it no, even less power. Um, but it's a great place to start. I've been, I'm very fond of two strokes even to this day i mean yeah. um if i buy another water buffalo which i probably will that'll be my 10th so uh, i just keep it, it's it's like something i keep revisiting they're great. Riding a two-stroke on the street is is a unique experience. Is it like the crabs of motorcycles? Yep. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's, 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 it's a forgotten yeah. era. They take a bit of riding because you don't That's what she have said. power oh. everywhere. <laughs> and you've actually, you, you, you kind of get into this um, conserving momentum. Because you know you haven't got power anywhere except right at the top. Yeah. So you think of ways of getting this thing down the road and just keep the ref counter buried at the top. Right, it's better to have like a 17-speed transmission that you can just keep between 13,000 and 14,000 RPM and just right. do everything with RPM, you know? Right. Yeah, it's, uh, I wanted to bring the two-stroke thing up as the topic tonight and not even considering modern two-strokes or anything else, but the idea of just that the, the idea behind two-stroke motorcycles never goes away. And as much as some people would like to see it go away, riding the, um, you know, riding the S3 
in Santa Cruz was a slap in the face to everybody who loves the environment. And yes. we got we got some shitty looks and we got some some really I mean, it's noisy as fuck. It's smoky as fuck. It's generally impolite. And it because it is on chambers, it really just likes to stay on the pipe. And so if it's not on the pipe, if it's not over 5,000 RPM, you know, at any moment, it's going to load up one of those cylinders and stall and not start again. Yeah, but right, I can so argue I that think that now, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Steve. I, I can argue now that a non-catalyzed bike is going to be the two stroke of the future. So you ride behind a non-catalyzed bike and you could smell the hydrocarbons just spewing out of that thing. So it's like, you know, it's it's so, I mean, nothing against you, Nick, because I love that bike. But, you know, when you're behind, you know, it depends on what pecking order you are in the line. If you're way back and you're behind somebody that doesn't have cats, then, man, you're smelling hydrocarbons the whole time. So and I don't mind it, well, but I'm just saying that somebody's going to complain. I've been on rides where 90% of the vehicles. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the bandit's a 400 CC that gets 14 miles to the gallon. So the bandit. That ride, I got 44 miles to the gallon. On a 400 CC bike. Yeah. Yeah. He also had his idle at like 9,000 RPMs the entire time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I really like, not joking, there's been so many rides that I've been on where 90% of the bikes in the ride were two strokes. And I also used to do these rides in northern Georgia that were 50 cc's and under. And so we'd go riding around the mountains in northern Georgia on 40. Oh, the Simpsons feet. perfect for that. What's it's that? Perfect. The Simpsons, perfect for that. <laughs> I know. I honestly, it, it, Emma, it, I don't think this. I don't think the Simpson is perfect for anything other than no, Jackie. Oh, no, no, easy, no, 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 no. Fella, easy. Hey, listen. I look <laughs> after a Simpson Schwalbe for for my celebrity client. In fact, the first time I came down See? to Misfits, I was on a Simpson Schwalbe. See, they're great, oh, comrade. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it is it was, exactly the bike to ride to the gulag. <laughs> it was exactly the right bike to ride when you were joining Norman Reedus's TV program, Ride, and you know it's going to break down and you'll get more airtime because that's exactly what happened. But I, I, had, I had to ride it, though, because it's just so fucking weird that I'm like, no one is. No one that watches this show is going to know what this is. I know Norman is not going to know what this is. Like, I have to bring this bike. Like, I know it's not going to make it, and it didn't. I know it's going to end up in the in the in the truck, which it did. <laughs> but, <laughs> but God damn it, we gave it our all, and uh, you know it was. But it was a blast, and that really is why I wrote it. And my BMW was over was not in the country. So anyway, <laughs> it was weird, and I wanted to take it, and I did it, and I had to stay high on the pipe. And in order to kind of keep up with their modern, beautiful, luxurious Triumph Tigers that they were on. Um, but we had a really good time, and we got a bunch of laughs out of it. And I'm always willing to take one for the team, as long as it gets a couple laughs and, <laughs> and you know, and it amuses people. So we had fun, and then I ended up jumping in one of my friend's sidecars. And then we ended up, like, floating the chair and doing all that kind of fun stuff. So we so, had a really good time. I don't know if you guys can see it, but I just put up a picture of two uh, Simpson Schwalbas. There you go. Uh, the, oh, the no, one no, the, the way that that's the yellow one. That's the generation two. The yeah. gen one, they were always blue. They were always <laughs> sloppy at blue. And if you take a look at all the other vehicles in this picture, every other vehicle in this picture is a tribute Brilliant to Eastern East Bloc technology. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if you look at, okay, so it's like the Trabant. So you've got a Trabant, you've got a couple of MZs, you've got clearly a piston ported something with leg shields back here. Um, yeah, this entire ride made it exactly 900 feet. Seriously, are the passenger pegs bolted to the exhaust pipe on that thing? <laughs> they might be. They are. Yeah, you're they not are. wrong. <laughs> <laughs> It's brilliant. Oh, I had to have it. God. I saw it at a bike show here in Kentucky and I'd never, yeah. and I was purposely on the hunt for something small displacement at German. And okay. you're, unfortunately, you're half right. 
R25s through R27s uh, went through the roof really recently, which sucks and it's unfortunate. But anyway, that's what I really wanted. But um, an acquaintance of mine had a red Simpson, the Schwalbe, on display. Right. And I walked over to it. And I didn't know what the hell it was, but I knew it was super cute. And, of course, it didn't start. Notice notice a theme here. Of course, it didn't start. So we had to pull the cowling off to expose the engine. And then the engine is all stamped in German. Right. So I was like, oh! <gasps> What? What is this unicorn of small displacement, weird as fuck motorcycling? And he said, yeah, I imported a pair of them from Hungary. Yeah. And uh, do, you, do you want to buy the other one? And I was like, literally couldn't get my checkbook out fast enough. And was like, yes, like, yes, I do. And went and picked it up. And I, I think, I mean, I've only seen a handful of them here in the U.S. They showed one um, of the yellow. They showed the yellow one at Quail like two years ago. I was like, <laughs> like what? What? And they're in a total cult bike now. And I see people cutting them up as you should. Um, mm-hmm. They cut them up when, over in Europe and make all sorts of rad stuff out of them. And now they're making the Emmy or Emma. I don't remember the name. And it's an electric version of that exact same bike. Wow. So, um, Jackie, darling, are you are you a member of the Facebook group for Simpson Schwalbe? I think I am. I think I. You think should I am. be. You need yeah. to be. No, I, because I, I, that's I, where I, you're going to get all your updates. That's where you get all your updates of yeah. what the Eastern Bloc people are doing to them, and it's it's quite spectacular. Yeah, I think I am because that's why that's why I think I've been seeing these images of them being like slammed and stretched and just all sorts of crazy stuff going on with them. So um, I, I'm really pumped to have it. It's a cool, neat thing, and it, I, it was also it was further further scratching the itch. Uh, pun intended of uh, getting into the two stroke racket. So Fair now enough. I've now I've gone down the rabbit hole of Kawasaki dirt bikes and a couple of other other fun things. But the, that that Simpson just is I just I love I love that little thing. Uh, uh, we went off on a tangent. So oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah, we totally did. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> That's no, no that tangent. Was totally related I mean, to motorcycles. We go off on tangents, and it's not even related to motorcycles. <laughs> well, yeah, no shit. I've got an interesting. I got an interesting anecdote. And it's kind of motorcycle. It's definitely two stroke. But when I was young, there was this big deal called the RAC Rally, and the RAC Rally was a traditional off-road car rally course. It went around the whole of Britain. And it came through my hometown. And back then, a couple of the East German teams had factory teams competing. And there was this car called the Wartburg. And the Wartburg (laughs) is a really interesting car. It's 800cc, two-stroke, three-cylinder. And the works Wartburg rally car had three expansion chambers sticking out the back of it. It was wild. And this thing had come through the forest section doing about 90 miles an hour. And it, it, was, it sounded like nothing on earth. So there you go. Two strokes. Love Two strokes, strokes baby. The, uh, Two strokes. <laughs> Speaking of, I'm sure because that was such a great, I mean, I just, I love the Eastern geeky, Eastern European or Eastern German history with motorcycles in particular, but all transport really. But I, have you all read or are familiar with the book called Stealing Speed? Because it is phenomenal. It is such a great, great book. And it's all about, it's all about this topic and how the sci- the development of two-stroke engines went from east and defected during the GP season at, in the late 50s, early 60s and went over to Suzuki. Anyway, mm-hmm. it's a it's a great book. It's super super interesting. Uh, Matt Oxley, I think, is the author of it, and it is re- they reissued it again because for a minute there you couldn't find it anywhere because it just kept selling out. So anyway, just oh, that's another, cool. Another, more, more, so, geek, is, more geekiness for you. And that's what that's uh that's predominant. Is it predominantly two stroke tuning? Is that kind of the game? The book you that's mean? the Wartburg Rally Car. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. rad. Yeah, that's the. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> You can't see the expansion chambers sticking out the back, but that's exactly what it looked like. Fast as to, hell. We need to what see it. For me, it's Germany looked like a Fiat 124. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, they just copied their designs. But the two-stroke, it's an easy engine to build. For its size, it can make good power, which is why it's very, very tempting, or it used to be, Make a two-stroke, 
it's going to have more power than a four stroke, which is true. It's going to go quicker. It's going to weigh less, but it's going to be a lot dirtier. So you take something like Phil's S3. That thing makes far more power than, say, what do you say its competitor was, Phil, a 404? Yeah, absolutely. If you took that bike and because of the era, you could you could go to the dealership, right? On the same day, you could go to the dealership and you could buy an S3 two-stroke triple uh, that was probably about 20% less money than a CB400F Super Sport. Right. And that you could literally go to the, the Kawasaki dealer and go to the Honda dealer in the same day and look at those two bikes. And the numbers were really funny because um, if you get down to riding either one of those bikes, it's a totally different riding experience. The CB400F is velvet smooth, but it never, ever gives you that like, whoa, experience. And in fact, to people who ride modern motorcycles, when you're riding a CB400F, you're like, man, this thing is fucking underpowered. Yet at some point you look down and you're doing 105 miles an hour and you don't really right. know how you got. There. Whereas the S3, it was just like, fuck you scary from the second you let the clutch out. Because if you didn't have 4,000 revs on, it would stall. And then you so, yeah, I mean, let's talk about that. We'll go back in time to 1974 and you've got like a thousand bucks in your pocket. Yeah. <laughs> so here's your choices. You can go into the Honda dealer and there's your very, very early, probably at 354. The 404 yeah, hasn't come along yet. Absolutely. So there's 354. There's choice number one. Expensive, yeah. velvet smooth, slow, pretty much unexciting. <laughs> Kawasaki dealer. <laughs> Hey, don't don't diss the three fifty fours. The three fifty fours. The three fifty fours. So you know, wonderful week, uh, little bike. He said that it's was his favorite be- bike. Just so you know, <laughs> they're beautiful little bikes, but you ain't going to describe that thing as quick. Oh no, it's not quick. But it's I don't give a shit. <laughs> no, they they are delightful little bikes. But so you've got your three fifty four, then your S three. Yeah. Bill's S3, and we know all about that. Yamaha, that'd be an R5. Yep, it would have been an R5. Which is a damn quick bike. And then Suzuki, which would seem the weakest choice, but I think the time's been kindness to it. GT380. GT380 with torque induction. Right. And the GT380 has got a lot going for it now, in retrospect. It's heavy. It's kind of not as exciting looking as the s3 i think it's right. better looking than the r5 it's as pretty as the 354 in my opinion see but i think the engine looks like it's chiseled out of stone <laughs> it, well it kind of does because that rem air doesn't do it any favors but when you see them nice with all the polished alloy on them when they were new they are pretty bikes and the early ones with the drum brake are prettier still. Yeah, this, like a uh, lot of bikes, really it is, started I think off pretty and mark. got ugly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They, but was I think what was really good about those and and what gave that bike a lot of the character was that it did have that. I hate to say it, but that that motor with the crazy torque induction scoop on the top of it is just it's silly. It's almost comical, but it is. I mean. It did have, I think in its day, it probably would have been the best machine to have as a road bike, like as a straight up, right. you're going to ride it every day kind of thing. You're going to commute on it. Um, I never did get used to that weirdo double plastic uh, taillight that they had. Oh, the um, dog bone. The dog bone taillight. <laughs> yeah, the dog bone taillight. It was, so, many, so many Suzukis were afflicted with that particular taillight. Oh, that was and, the corporate taillight. Yeah, but the was, early was, ones, if you find a picture of a 72, it yeah, gets even wilder than that because it's got the dog bone tail light, it's got the horseshoe headlight, yeah, drum yeah. front brake, it's wild, yeah, and that's, crazy that's the turn signals. One, yeah. The turn signals look like phasers off Star Trek. Yeah. Yeah. It was nuts. They must have been drinking a bunch of sake when that thing rolled off the production line. <laughs> it's very nostalgic to look back at it, and that's why we like them. We like things like the crazy torque induction cylinder head because yeah. it's of the time, and that's why we like these bikes. 
And so I was, I came up with this idea and this idea was, okay, you have to pick a two stroke motorcycle with less than 400 CCs. And because obviously if you let it go over 400 CCs, you can get into like, you know, uh, there's so many bikes that are over, like there's NSI, right. like, there's just so many bikes that are 500 cc's that are two strokes that are just ridiculously amazing. But putting like the four, 400, like 399s and below her, uh, it's a, it's a really interesting one to think of like, what bike would you have now? Willing- Every day of the week. Which one, Emma? The 380. No the 380. question about it at all. The 380. Yeah, the 380. You know, yep. it's, it's, and it's, you could argue it is the weakest of all of them. But when you take the mm-hmm. whole package, it's not as quick as the S3. It's right. not as pretty as the 354. Right. Right. It's not as agile as the R5. But that's kind of not the point. You've got to take the whole package. And yeah. it is such a fucking charming bike. Yeah. I, and that's the thing is for a long time, we couldn't get rid of GTs around our shop. Like we had so many people popping up with, with small displacement GTs and Titans, which is also funny. You know, the, the 500s. Oh God. <laughs> and, <laughs> Those things. And I think James still has two Titans leaning against the back of his garage right now that are free. If anybody wants to show up and just take them away, I think, I think the that's offer too still stands safe. No, that's too much money for a Titan. Worth, worth every penny. <laughs> so, God. Yeah. So I, I guess thinking at it, I just don't know. Um, going at it, going after it, I still have a soft spot for those triples. So I would probably still be looking at a Kawasaki. And again, I had to throw it out because my brain wants to be practical. My brain wants to say, dude, get an RD. They're easy to get parts for. They're right. cheap. They're super easy to work on past the labyrinth seal. Like an RD is an easy bike to keep on the road. You keep yes. good reads in the thing. It's an easy bike to keep on the road. Uh, but that's not the challenge. The challenge is the fucking one you want, despite it's, problems and i think i do i think i hate to admit it but center cylinder and all i'll take that stupid s3 <laughs> right That's it. and you know this they're, yeah. so, they're really good looking bikes oh my god yeah. you get one in a good color like the green yeah the green they're, they are yeah. really good looking they're bikes. really good looking who else, who else has a take on the styling yeah who else has a take on uh, an old uh, an old two-stroker my my very first bike was a CT one seventy five. Oh, okay. Nineteen seventy two. For CT two, I'm sorry, CT two one seventy five. Yeah. Right. Was my very first bike. Uh, my the chemistry professor von Banken let me borrow it because my dad didn't want me to have it, and that's what I rode. I took my test on it. I rode that thing everywhere, and I love that bike. But that's the only two stroke I ever had, except for my moped. Mm-hmm. And I never really cared for two strokes. I don't like peaky power. I like torque. I like low end torque. And they're like low. I'd rather have a diesel. If I could get a diesel, <laughs> get a diesel. <laughs> but hey, that's so, hey, I'm Steve, not two strokes. So. So Steve, Steve would actually have a two stroke diesel motorcycle. Right. Turbo diesel, probably. John, Turbo I diesel. see. John, I see. Mechel Fresh is holding up a Yamaha. But here's my. Yeah, I can't tell which Yamaha it is. That's a Yamaha Big Bear Scrambler 250. Oh, that's right. I, oh, that's a I great owned, bike. Oh my god. Yeah. Forgot yeah, about the Big Bear. I, I scored one of those. It was all apart and everything, and it's one of my regrets that I never got it to put it together and ride it. But because it, it was in the era when I was kind of into two strokes and. It needed a lot of work, and I didn't have a lot of time, and I ended up bundling it up and selling it off to a guy. But it, it, had, been, it had been torn apart and put in a shed a long, long time ago, and it was in really great shape. And I got really – I paid like two or 300 bucks for it, ended up selling it for $1,500, still all apart, you know, needed the motor rebuilt and stuff like that. But I really, really liked that bike. I really wanted I, – I regret never having put it together and ridden it. And then I rode – my buddy Kevin has uh, – the not the scrambler version the catalina the, with the low pipes and and bruce had one for a while there too and it was a really nice bike you know kind of a precursor to the r5 and 
it's not really ridiculous as far as horsepower, but it would light up when you hit the revs, you know, like any two stroke. The other comment that I have yeah. is some of the modern two strokes, you know, uh, what was it? Aprilla had, you know, Derby's done little two strokes, liquid cool do two strokes. And then I think Aprilla had that RS125, yep. which was, a, you know, and I think that may have actually been like a Yamaha YZ motor in that bike. I don't know if that was a proprietary motor. One of them had a Yamaha YZ125 in basically a sport bike frame. That's That would be a hell of a lot of fun because, you know, I really – the, those little single cylinder, easy to work on, simple motor, liquid cooled, relatively reliable. And those, I know those Aprilla RS 125s would do a hundred mile an hour. Yes, they would. Absolutely. Well, there's a lot of stuff that was Moto GP, <laughs> like, Moto, Moto GP technology. Who's your, who's your uh, friend, was, Phil? Uh, that's a, that's a ribbon I found with a, with a, my friend Liza hooked to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's uh that's 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 real that's happening an interesting yeah. little fact too that i didn't even realize i happened to be on yamaha's website yamaha still sells the two-stroke yz125 and yz250 yeah, yeah. It'd be a lot of fun to ride one of those brand new 2020 here's my question so steve said that he'd like a diesel or whatever for two strokes but the whole point of a two-stroke dirt bike is it's tractoring capabilities at low like it has torque out the ass. So, I mean, are they just, are they just geared differently or what's the difference between an off-road two stroke and an on-road two stroke? Cause off-road two strokes, they're the Kings of like being in first gear and almost idling up a hill, you know, cause they have enough power to do it. Right. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just saying. Yeah. That, I mean, I think that's always been a deal with, uh, I started riding. So my first dirt bike, just like Jackie, my first dirt bike was an Elsinore. So I had a 1974 Honda MT250 Elsinore. And that was, uh, I bought that bike. And to give you an idea of how stupid I was, I rigged up a full set of turn signals for it so I could drive it back and forth to work on the street. And so I had functional turn signals. I had every, everything. It was a dual purpose. Um, and you got to keep in mind, this is in the very early 90s. And I was commuting back and forth to it uh, to work now. But here's the caveat. I was living in Willoughby and I was working in downtown Cleveland and I was riding an MT250 on the freeway <laughs> every day at 75 plus miles an hour on a two stroke. And uh, it only took about nine months for me to hold a piston. So <laughs> you got to burn that thing out pretty fast. Yeah. It took about nine months. It took like one full season of riding and I was on my way home and I was like, this thing does great. And I was carrying about 75 to 80 miles per hour. And then just all the magic went out the tailpipe. <laughs> you were <all> Didn't you? <laughs> Two stroke magic. <laughs> you, forgot your, you forgot your own rule. You, your own, right. you forgot your own rule with two strokes. It's full throttle and then back, back it off a quarter. Right. right, full throttle and back it off. And that's what the rule, if it's ever running better than it's ever run before, shut it off. Yeah. <laughs> that means it's about ready to hand grenade. I know that yep. lesson. You've got an air leak somewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What's that sound? Did I drop some change on the – did I drop some change? <laughs> oh, no, that's your piston, dear. That's your piston back there. Don't worry about it. You don't need that. That's yeah. for quitters. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that doesn't make you faster. <laughs> mm -mm. Just lighten that load. It's just a better yeah. power to weight ratio. You're good. Yeah. I was, uh, I, I, that was one that I was extraordinarily close to my house when it just suddenly, it just suddenly went, ha. Huh. And the noise was actually, huh? I've had several seizures, the medical and mechanical kind. <laughs> and I know the sound of a seizure coming on. But this particular one made none of the signs. It gave me none of the warning whatsoever. It just went, huh? And when it went, huh? I looked behind me and I could see parts of my piston leaving my tailpipe. <laughs> and it was just, a, and at that point on, it was like, I it didn't, I didn't have to downshift. I didn't have to do anything because it didn't matter what gear I was in. There was no compression. And I'd put a, I put a thumb size hole in the top of that piston. So well done. So yeah, that became a two seventy six kit. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> the guys at Weisco got a call about that one. The, uh, so, yeah, that's, I mean, that's cool. Uh, Jackie would like to announce that Jackie has entered the world of podcasting. 
Jackie. I've jumped in with the rest of you dorks. That's right. <laughs> Way to hit it early. I finally, <laughs> you know, I like to be just right, right on the precipice, you know, right, right there with it. Um, no, because I do, I do live streams, you know, I do, I do vlogs, I do video stuff. I, I do this. Right. Yep. So um, I've been doing this for three years now. And this past like, you know, year that podcasting has just blown up all over the place. The folks over at Chopper Town have reached out and they're like, Hey, we keep having people bang on our doors like where's a motorcycle podcast where's the motorcycle podcast where's your where's your motorcycle podcast more importantly <laughs> and so he's like so do you want to do a motorcycle podcast i was like fuck all right i guess i guess i'll have to like talk into a microphone you won't be able to see me i can wear my pajamas i don't have to do makeup like oh okay no now i'm totally into this okay awesome so it took me, it took me forever because I'm not very, uh, you know, like garage band and the right. programs like that are not really my strong suit. So it took me forever to figure all that shit out, but I finally did. And it just was an idea kind of a play off of the vlog that I've been doing for three years. Uh, once a week, I started going into like the history of motorcycles. So oh, okay. uh, it was, it's going to be that's So I've already written out 50 episodes and it's wow. going to be, it's going to be the history of motorcycles. And so every episode will be about 30 minutes or so. I didn't want them to be crazy long. Uh, and the first like 10 minutes will be, you know, me and then yeah. a little bit of the history of a particular brand or time or, or, or bike. And then the last half will be an interview with somebody who is either like a fan of that bike or an expert of that bike or rides that bike or whatever. And then it's just kind of like a casual conversation. And it's a little bit like inspired by the topic of this, of the show. So Anyway, but Phil very sweetly posted up and gave me some big kudos and high fives online the other day. So I thought that was really awesome because I, you are, you are, you are way up there on my list. So thank you. Totally not completely not shilling for her podcast, but I listened to it <laughs> and two things. Brevity is the soul of wit. So one, she did not sound like there was any chance of her running on for three fucking hours. So <laughs> You get to your point and fucking hit it. So she did that and she had history that I didn't know about at all. So you have to listen to her podcast episode one, because you will learn a thing about motorcycles and from whence they came. So uh, that's badass. Anybody who teaches me something, rock on, keep going. So it was well done. No, I have a concern in the question because you said, Podcasts are cool because you don't have to put makeup on or dress up or anything. We <laughs> do a lot. I don't understand those words at all. <laughs> I know you don't, dear. It must be nice having a penis. That sounds well, great. <laughs> <laughs> and I would like to say both both Emma and Jackie are the loveliest thing that we've had on this podcast <laughs> ever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to put my makeup on, darling. Okay, this podcast is usually pretty, the standard's real freaking low. I mean, it's about here, hey, right? Hey, 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 hey. Hey! No, what I'm thrilled about is now people have got the, the grand trifecta, the three podcasts, because before it was really just listen to two podcasts and you're done. And that is, of course, Cleveland Moto, and motorcycles and misfits and that's it. Yeah. Now there, three, now there are three. Yes. Now there are three. Now there are three podcasts to listen. Holy to. Trinity of motorcycle. I listen. Exactly. To, I, Everything you need to know. I think I Everything. listen to about seven motorcycle podcasts. So, and I do. I mean, I I I do burn through. Um, I was just thinking that until Emma and Jackie showed up, Oscar was the prettiest person <laughs> in our <laughs> group. <laughs> he is very pretty though to be fair if you had to bump me for oscar i really kind of get that like very pretty very pretty no oscar is very well groomed <laughs> take it oscar take it baby but, but thank you i super appreciate you listening to it and then giving me the kudos and high fives i you know i love the history of motorcycles i realize everybody that's on this zoom right now is clearly we're all bike dorks and we love this stuff but i never know when i put stuff out into the world like does anybody else give a shit or am I just talking to hear myself talk here? So um, I do appreciate the positive feedback because it's stuff that I think is really interesting and, and hopefully, hopefully somebody else does too. You know, Jackie, I, um, over the years, you know, I've been doing Emma's history holds for a long time for <clears throat> motorcycles and misfits and we go all over the board. And I've actually said to Liza, look, 
people are getting tired of these things. We need to, to stop them. And she says, far from it. They are by far the highest rated shows. And Do Emma, motorcycles and misfits Emma, do. Your, Emma, your whole is magnificent. Thank you, darling. I You'd be amazed say, what I pluck out of there. Yeah, the, what you've pulled out of your hole has never, ever. Been wow. Has never, but amazing. Right, nothing exactly. but exactly. But yeah. so oh, what a, people how proud are, you must but, be. But <laughs> people well, I mean, actually I mean, love I, historical anything to do with how we got to where we are right now well that's, that's fascinating that I, for that people i think is super interesting is how cyclical it is mm -hmm. like it is just con like no pun intended there yes but like how it, it is constantly just repeating itself it's just it's the same over and over and over and you can see the trends and the patterns and the waves and you can see like when you look at any motorcycle really if you look at it with a little bit of a diff different or a little bit of a frame of reference yeah. you can literally tell i can tell exactly what's going on in the world at that time that bike is made mm -hmm. you know because of the way it looks or the design behind it or what it's meant to do or what it's meant to be you can tell the history globally of the world just by looking at motorcycles mm -hmm. and i think that that's that's my big my big like my big boner for, for motorcycle history. Yeah, and I do agree that like we were joking around here when we saw Cafe Racers hitting several years ago and we were kind of at the shop and we realized that Cafe Racer culture was going to come back again. And when Cafe Racer culture came back, to a lot of people, remember, that was their first introduction to motorcycles. And for us, though, we were like, oh, dig out all that shit again. You know, like, OK, find those, you know, oh, OK, find those fucking clip ons. OK, we remember where to get those and dig oh, out Emgo's phone number, you know, and we did. And it was like and it was the funniest thing, because then when that was doing its thing, a bunch of us were kind of sitting around going. So you do know that scramblers are next, right? No, and, totally. No, and it was just like, I mean, there is there is a fucking progression, right? Yeah, it's it's, and it's, I, it's I amazing said, to watch. I, and I know people are going to fucking call me on it, but I, I did say, I said, like, well, when, when early 90s katanas become the shit, <laughs> you're going to have to lock me in a cage for about three years. <laughs> just go on holiday, my friend. I don't know how, know how much you love to travel. Just go on holiday. Just just get out of here. Just just remove yourself from the scenario. But that being said, not Katana because that's its own ballywick. But, you know, uh, late 80s, early 90s dirt bikes are yeah. are totally booming right now. I don't know if that's on your radar. I mean, I don't I don't want to talk down to anybody, but they're yeah. like super shit hot right now. So the 90s and then by the 90s the extension is going to be the early 2000s. Like that's that's what's coming next. I'm pumped about the 80s and 90s stuff though cuz I love like especially those dirt bikes like oh my god, hot pink and well, turquoise everything. I love it. I love it. But that you see that's a very valid point. The I'm really disappointed how frightened the Japanese manufacturers are by color now. When we, if we go back to the 90s, yeah. their palette was so much Unbelievable. More, so it, wild, it was, so rowdy, so crazy. I mean, the Suzuki, what, R, RS250 oh, had the oh, we're giraffe. Gonna, we're going for a little walk right now. <laughs> oh, I see that. It had the giraffe print seat. And it was yellow. It was like a mustardy, uh, marigoldy yellow, and like brown. It was it was crazy. And then it had like pink and shit on it. It was awesome. Yeah, but um, you have to also realize that it was the era of Miami Vice, right? Yeah. Exactly. So that's the thing is you they, now there's they, a oh, bad there shit go. crazy nineties paint job. <laughs> oh, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll take that. I accept that. That's as bad shit crazy as it gets. I could use more hot pink and aqua, but that's just me. That's just my two. Oh, believe me, it's vivid purple. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, my personal favorite is the checkerboard BMW yeah. uh, uh, K, what was oh. that, 1100? Yeah. yeah, those things are nuts. I, lo I love that bike. I mean, I and I would never own one because I don't like the <laughs> seating position, but I love that bike. I mean, I love the look of that bike. So. Well, I think you're seeing a retraction in wild design and wilder paint schemes because mm -hmm. the market has been down for well over 10 years now i think i think i think honestly develop i think 
OEMs and manufacturers are just scared shitless <laughs> to go outside the box to push the envelope a little bit. You know, their version of pushing the envelope was turning a bike or like a scrambler to a tracker. Like that's right. the big shift that happened in cool bikes in the past three years is right. scrambler to tracker. I mean, that's not a shift. That's nothing. Like that's a change in tires. That's, that's, that's there's true. no difference there. But nobody's doing anything truly, truly outside the box because they're just terrified. Well, do you think that, I, I mean, looking at the different bikes that are out right now, so everyone went crazy crazy for the smart pillion, the, the fart pillion and the hooped pillion and all the different, uh, the, the speeds, you know? So all these, these, Oh God, I love that bike. That little 401. <gasps> right. The 401. And, yes. But do you think like, I think people were very excited to see that bike because the gas tank was so exotic looking and it was like yes. art. Cause and, no, the consumer wants it. People right. want it. We crave it, but it's the manufacturers that all have this old business mentality right. and they're in this bubble. You know, they don't, they don't talk to younger people. They don't talk to real people. They don't talk to real motorcyclists. I hate to say it, but I mean, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't, I know I'm not wrong in this because I've met these people that are VPs of motorcycles and they're 65 year old white guys that yeah. don't ride and that don't talk to motorcyclists and don't know what the hell is going on out here. So I think they're absolutely the reason why I think e-bikes have been taking up so much space uh, digitally, especially is because they look different. Like for oh, yeah. God's sake, they just look different. Like give me something different and small by the way, and affordable, but that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother conversation. Right. And I totally, and I, that's one of those things that I feel that it has been sort of the, somebody's thumb has been on it for way too long yeah. and it, it's going to have to get uncorked because right now I just feel like there's nothing out there that's really exciting and really opens you up. If everyone loses their fucking mind over the uh, Husqvarna, uh, then that tells you that we're ready for something. And that's uh, you, you can't keep coming out with the same crap. So, yeah, I think that John, John kept holding up pictures of bikes from the 90s and the 80s that were where the frame was actually pink from the factory. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's like, I, had to, like, I had a GR250 that was like blue, white, right. pink, teal, yellow. I'm like, holy yeah. shit. Yeah, when well, they all look like wave runners. <laughs> well, yeah, and if you look at and if you look at the way my skateboard looked in 1988, my skateboard had multicolored plastic screwed into everything. I had grind rails, I had truck protectors. Like that was the era to have like 19 different colors on one deck. Yeah. And yeah. That's that's the aesthetic and that's what's coming next as far as collectibles. I mean it's yeah. already it's already here but that's 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 a thing that's real and it's because our generation is doing, you know, of course our nostalgia bikes just like, you know, those small displacement Hondas went through the fucking roof, you know, 8 years ago cuz every 50-year-old was like, I've got to relive my childhood childhood and I need to buy a, you know, 350 for $5,000 and you know, whatever. So, uh, you know, but now it's going to be 40 somethings ish right. who these are the bikes of our right. childhood now. And so we're going to start snap, snapping these bikes up and I'm already seeing it out here, but I do think, you know, the more I'm excited for that though, because maybe like there's a chance that, that, the bigger picture will see that we are collecting right. and purchasing wild bikes with colors and stuff on them. And maybe that'll, maybe that'll come back. I really thought that this Corona would free up a whole bunch of Emaxes. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We are, we are really we are really early in these days you gotta you gotta just sit on that for just a hot more minute but i promise you, you thought, there will be more gonna, bikes released back into the wild <laughs> if you thought there, there were a lot of non-running gold wings out there oh. wait till you see what's gonna happen now yeah wait till <laughs> you'll be able to buy them by the container be free <laughs> <laughs> i think they're gonna come free with a purchase of yeah, toilet paper it's, it's gonna be it and it is uh i i so just so you know mid ohio is still not officially so canceled wild. <laughs> didn't they push the date or no <laughs> Oh, again, again, it's it's bizarre because we're getting to the point now where we're circling. So we're circling to the point where Las Vegas is like, we're going to open up. It's worth it. 
Yeah. It's cool. Yeah, it's so <laughs> yeah, let's see how this goes. In, interestingly <laughs> enough, I don't know how relevant this is, but this week, Pebble Beach, the Concord Elegance people, and that's money. Right, that's big they money. They cancelled. Yeah. That's big money, but they, they cancelled. So, Demo, when do they normally run that? Uh, Pebble that Beach is August. August. Yeah. August, right? It's, it's the, like the there was a post August, on Facebook. Right? There was a post on Facebook that Insane Clown Posse just canceled their concert. <laughs> so <laughs> officially, true. our government is less smart than the juggalo. <laughs> ICP. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, yeah, that's Pebble sad. Beach and Quail. Quail canceled uh, outright. They're not even going to reschedule. Quail is right. is gone until 2021. Right. Also. Right. And, and that that actually happened very very quickly jackie because i you know because that's my back door i mean i'm uh, like 15 15 minutes from the quail so uh, as misfits we work really closely with the people who put on the quail and they pull nice. the plug on that very quickly i've only oh, had the man. chance to go one but it's a but it's a brilliant oh, event. Yeah, I absolutely loved it. <laughs> it's it's its own thing uh, I have a I have a very love hate relationship with a quail. It's very pretentious. Yes. It's very snobby. It's yes. very moneyed. Yes. But it's a spectacle. <laughs> and if and if you like bikes of a certain type, there's nothing like it. Yeah. So I just go love ahead, it. Dan. It's the grounds so are beautiful. Oh. Oh, sorry. A lot of these little events, if they cancel these before they're told they have to cancel it, they lose a lot of money. Right. Oh, so sure. waiting, the state oh. or whoever they go, you have to cancel this. And then they don't, they're not tied to that contract oh, anymore. Oh, Jay, he's a great That's guy. That's true. That's people. true. Well, there's definitely a lot of winners and especially a lot of losers in all okay. this, you know. This guy, I, I mean, people are losing their ass left and right. And I don't, it's true. Don't it's, it's a strange. Really it's definitely a strange time. It's a really strange scenario that we're all in, and you know, I, everybody just has to make the best judgment call that they can. And and yes, it has. There's of course a lot of potential money on the line, but I think at the end of the day, they'll be able to file for their insurances and that kind of that bit of it will be okay but they have to think of the people that are all traveling to this event and their staff having to to be around all these people and you know i think they're just they're just trying to make the safest right. decision that they can well americade americade is switched to july 25th so they, they're usually the first week in june and now they're july 25th so you have all these people that booked a year in advance on the first week of june so what do you do with that i mean i guess those rooms are vacant and, and now you have to see if you get it. Yeah. What'd you say, Oscar? I, I don't think it's going to be enough just one month push for an event like that. Yeah. yeah. I'm chalking it up as a black summer, man. I'm just, I'm not planning on doing anything. Yeah. I'll do what I have to do. I have to work and stuff like that. That's all I'm going to do. Well, I know it's right. Well, I mean, in motorcycle life, the other, the other only thing that has not come off of the table, which I do not anticipate coming off the table, period, is Sturgis. Sturgis is absolutely doubling down on it. They're saying, we're, we are going, we are rocking, we are rolling. Um, they are not they are not hemming or hawing about it. They are still full steam ahead over there. So, so you're saying that um, Harleys are going to go the way of oil. They'll be paying people to take them soon. <laughs> <laughs> no, free with toilet paper. Remember? Right. That's, I, I totally. And and that is the thing about Sturgis. Um, I can see that. I, I can absolutely identify with that. Uh, the way they operate. And it is, that is ground zero for a lot of the folks that are saying that this is not happening. Yeah, right. So that hits them in their, that hits them where they live. And that's, to me, that is going to be like, it's going to be very much a certain type of people at Sturgis because Daytona has changed to the point where I've had a lot of customers come into my shop and are like, we're never going to Daytona ever again. And what, that's a certain person that says that there's a certain rider. There's a certain guy that says he's never going back to Daytona, but he's the guy who's going to double down on Sturgis. And yeah. that's where I see Jackie's on target because yeah, it's going to be Sturgis is going to be extraordinarily monochrome 
It's going to, it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be a really, really, um, it's going to be an echo chamber of, yeah. of it is what it is. And it's going to be it amplified is, yeah. by a hundred because it's the 80th. So mm-hmm. they've been anticipating, I don't know if you all are regular Sturgis goers or not, but on the like five years and, and 10 and even in, you know, zero years, right. it's, it's way bigger. It's when you get the big turnout. So for the past four years, everybody's been waiting for the 80th because the last big one was obviously the 75th. So so right. it's been really down on people coming. The money hasn't been as good, but they're still mm-hmm. charging just as much to go. You know, so it's been a little bit off. So mm-hmm. everybody was like holding their wallets and 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 waiting for the 80th. So now they're really not coming off of it. It is happening. And, you know, I I'm, I'm already have contact with a couple of companies and I very well might be going out there. That might be my only event for the summer. So I have to go because this is what I do for a living. <laughs> Full body well, condom. Think, yeah. Well, I think that this year, I believe that this year might be the 100th anniversary for Moto Guzzi or maybe it's next year. But the Moto Guzzi, the reunion that they do in Mandela Delario every year is massive and, and it shuts the whole city down and it's, yeah. it's pretty huge. And I, it's either this year or next year. I can't. I'm it should be next year. Sorry. In 1921 yeah, is when they were founded. 21, right? Yeah, yeah. 21. So, uh, so that's that kind of thing that that's another one of those that if no, if they don't do a, a Guzzi homecoming this year, Next year, oh, be for the massive it's next going year. To be oh my god, yeah, people are just right. going to lose their shit, and that's why I think Sturgis is going to be crazy too. I mean, I'm already even having friends reach out and are like, "When can we meet up someplace in June?" Like, not a whole bunch right. of people, not a rally, but like just a couple of homies <laughs> going to ride bikes. Like, <laughs> like people are ready; they're already chomping at the bit to just get the hell out. So, sure. I think Sturgis is just going to be crazy. Micro rallies. Well, my, I yeah. want to go. I'd like to go back to something Jackie said. I mean, this is how I earn my living. Yeah. There's a lot of people in this podcast right now. There's a disproportion of people who are involved in the motorcycle industry, right. myself included. Yeah. How's business been? <laughs> <laughs> Phil, I'll let because, you go ahead and jump uh, well, in on that. <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll start. We are busy. We are we're jamming over at Superbikes. Yeah. I'm not building race engines because nobody's racing. Nobody's racing. But that's been replaced by a lot of people who are like, I want my bike in the best possible condition that when I can go riding. Yes. So we're jamming. I, I go that. in. I go in at, in the morning and I jam until right. it's going home time. Yeah. And my garage is full of client bikes now as well. Yeah. The yeah. British. I believe store the storage and maintenance folks are crushing right now. Um, I also just noticed. I mean, I don't know. Phil could. I'm sure could speak to this a lot more than myself because I don't have like a shop. But if you even just look at where money is being spent right now everybody is buying stuff online. Not a surprise because we can't go anywhere, right? So people are stuck at home. It's going on week three now or week four for some folks. And you're going to break down and buy some shit. Whether you mean to or not, you're going to buy parts. You're going to buy stuff. You're going to decide to do a new big top end or whatever your deal is. So I know that the money is flowing. I know it is. What Um, else are you going to do with that stimulus money? Oh, what are you going to do with that $1,200 Trump check, right? So you may as well throw it at your bike. And so I know that this is to be true. And I know, and you thank you for confirming with me that this is a thing and is happening and people are getting their bikes worked on either by you or they're doing it themselves. Cause I do believe this to be true. But now from my side where I am going to manufacturers and to companies and saying, Hey, I know you have a huge shipping container of stuff from China that you ordered and is now here. And you thought you were going to go show it at a rally this month. And guess what? You're not going to show it at a rally this month or next month or probably the month after that. So why don't you send it to me and we'll do a digital launch together and I'll do like an unboxing and we'll do a demo or we'll do, you know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to be creative in this digital space, which is what I do and bring it to their attention of like, I am the new rally. Like, like you need, or, no, or, I mean, not even me. I'm not, I don't mean to sound like that guy, but like one of us out here <laughs> is the new rally. So if you think you're going to sit on your hands with your shipping container full of stuff and, and just wait 2020 out, like no. you can't, that's, you can't do that. So I'm having a couple of folks that are getting it. And now by week four, they're finally like, 
okay, you're right. Because they thought that this was only going to last for like a couple weeks, but they see that it's not. Um, but then I have another, like, it's, it's a, it's a coin toss, whether they're in or they're like, no, we're cutting budgets and we're just shutting our doors and waiting this out. Like I'm getting that too. So it's, you're getting to the point where people are going to have to start making a decision. So I, I work in media and, and promotions and things like that and whatever video. And there's actually, there's, in the hobby industry and a bunch of the other industries, they're going to be doing virtual trade shows this summer. So they're actually getting everybody together. They're going to actually design and they're going to have a dude build a website where these people get actual booths in this website for a virtual trade show to the point that they're actually animating walking down aisles and then you turn oh. the booth to see the stuff. So this is something that's happening 100%. Hey, jo- hey Oscar. So Oscar, I'm going to put it on you. If we're going to have virtual shows, we're going to need virtual booth babes. (laughs) (laughs) So Oscar, I know Oscar has the connection with all of his manga and his anime. (laughs) I'm expecting big things. No, Oscar is the best. Oscar is the best looking person on this podcast right now. So he is the virtual babe. Booth babe. He is your he booth is babe. Is, Oscar yeah. is the booth babe. Oscar is officially the booth meet of the Zoom conference. <laughs> I'm gonna have to I couldn't agree more. He, he is. has a couple that Jackie likes, so I don't know. <laughs> no, you know what's driving me wild? is that little white streak in his beard. You see, I've got this little white streak in my hair right now. Look, oh, look, 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 look. Oh, <laughs> um, he is Dang. just like a little white streak of credibility. He's the romantic. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I, it, back oh, to, yes. I love here, your background. Back to, back to science. Uh, yeah, it is true that our shop is selling um, virtually nothing in the way of traditional uh our, our normal retail stuff, like our helmets, jackets, gloves, nothing, right, right, because right. nobody's coming into the shop, right? No. So that's done. Forget about it. Um, so that's 30%, just not even happening. Retail sales of motorcycles. Well, the weird thing is I'm selling out of all of the zeros that are less than $12,000. Yep. So the zero okay. electric motorcycles right. that are less than twelve grand, they are fucking gone. Everybody wants them. I've sold all of them that I have and we are stealing them from other dealerships, right? We're getting them from other shops. So if it's under 12 grand, okay, it's under 10 grand, right? So that shit's gone. But the expensive stuff, the stuff that's 20 grand, nope, nobody, right? So that's not moving. And then the motorcycles in my shop, pre-owned motorcycles that are about under six grand or under seven grand, those are selling. Those are going good. Um, Anything that's over that, Nope, totally fucking dead. High end, high end uh, Vespas like the three hundred CCs. Nope, but the one fifties were selling okay. Now, not where we normally would be in April. We're about half of that, but I'm surprised that we're selling what we're selling. Now we are by appointment only. The door is fucking locked. Here's the thing that's going to kind of be interesting, and Emma's going to Emma's going to key into this. We are doing metric shit tons of service on bikes that haven't run in three or four or five or six or seven or eight or years. Yep. So people are digging the bikes out of the garage, yes. but it's different than it was in 08. They're not doing it. Dragon. Oh, Hey, there's a child. Look, he's got a child. Hello, darling. Uh, and that's why they need these motorcycles. That's why they got to go out and literally ride around and, and try to give themselves some fucking therapy. Right. Yeah. They're coming into the shop like mad. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this does none of this surprises me at all. And I mean, this is I'm glad to hear that from you guys, because I needed that feedback um, to put in my little arsenal. So when I start banging on doors again next week, I can be like, look, I know you are selling stuff. I know you're making money. You can't use that as an excuse. <laughs> right. And it's, it's a but really it, weird it, thing. It, it, it's a different kind of money, Jackie. Yeah, if I is. was a yeah. traditional dealer, the place I used to work at, 
I would be shitting my pants right now. Oh, yeah. Because it's the antithesis of what's going to do well. It's a big dealership. It's got a massive amount of square footage. They're paying thousands in flooring fees to fill it up. There's 200 bikes in stock. That's right. And And to rely on the workshop. Right. You know, it's talking to guys who are Triumph dealerships. Talking to guys that are um, Indian dealerships, they are fucking terrified right now because these manufacturers want to give them 40 and 50 and 60 and 80 more bikes, but they're still sitting on the ones from last October. Right. And the flooring fees are going to, they're killing them. But the place I'm at now, it's a little independent workshop. We've got a great reputation with the closest race shop to Laguna Seca. (laughs) So traditionally, yeah. We we build very high horsepower race engines. You know, we build 230 horsepower R1 engines and shit like that. And we still do that, but not now. Right. What we're doing now is people are dragging R6s out of the garage and Katanas and whatever. And, hey, this has been in my garage for four years. You know, I think I'd like to resurrect it. <laughs> and stuff like that. So we're word, busy. We're, we're, we're jamming. Oh, nice the pussy, word Phil. The, well, the word is pivot. Can you pivot? You know, Can any you business. Pivot? Out there, well, let me ask. Can you go from you know? I was a restaurant and I had ten you know these tabletops. Can you pivot to being like, well, now I'm going to go close to shop, but I'm going to take out, do take out, and right. and work that hard. Or if I'm a motorcycle shop, well. People can't come in my showroom, but I'm going to sell bikes online or I'm going to do a ton of service or like Phil says, I'll meet you in the parking lot with a mask. And let me ask how well you can, you can reacclimate yourself to the new marketplace. Exactly. I did say I'd meet you in the parking lot with a mask. So right. but yeah. Dan, you're, I had you're that one coming. We're south of Phil. And so Phil knows how he's doing and we kind of know how Phil's doing right now. So six hours south in Ohio, what's, what's the bike scene down there? Are you guys doing a lot of work or what's going on? Oh man, you know, I'm basically just working on, uh, scooters and a little bit of customer stuff we got coming in. Um, me and a couple guys run a small vintage shop down in Cincinnati, just working on uh, old Vespas. So we've been getting a fair amount of stuff in. Um, and I know my buddy Scott runs Queen City Moto and he's drowning in work right now. I mean, it's just coming in like, like wildfire, like Phil said, um, but yeah, with the weather breaking, everyone's really chomping at the bit. I know just getting out and getting around, you're seeing more people out on bikes. Um, well, that's one of the, and the good really things seems about like, motorcycles. One of the good things about motorcycles is it's a perfect way to social distance. Two people on bikes aren't aren't in touch with each other. It's true. That's true. <laughs> did, that, Phil, did that guy uh, pick up that uh, that Moto Gucci? Did he get that uh, Moto Guzzi that you were talking about last week? So, uh, yeah, the guy, so we had one of our listeners that came in and he was absolutely certain that he was either going to purchase, and I'm going to get this right, I can't, I can't remember exactly, uh, but he was absolutely going to purchase the, like a Kawasaki Versys or a Moto Guzzi V9 Roamer. And I was like, you couldn't be any more fucking apart on two motorcycles. I mean, (laughs) this is like, are you buying for two different people? Because the Versys is the Versys. The Versys is just for people who are just like, I just want technically a a universal motorcycle, right? I I don't give a shit what it looks like, but it has to be totally reliable and totally effective. And for that, I will go on record as saying that the the Kawasaki Versys is the world's greatest motorcycle. (laughs) <laughs> but it's okay if you hate it and the 650, not the, uh, 1, 000, the 650 what's that the 650 not the 1000 yeah, the 650 okay. just like a v-strom like the v-strom the 650 is magnificent but the 1000 is like hey did you need that yeah right Whereas yeah. the versus 1000 the versus 1000 is like a tall concourse and the versus 650 is like this perfect does everything motorcycle shaped tool that that can honestly can fucking do anything that you need to do okay and it's like a klr 650 that's happy on the highway so 
Oh, don't really get me started on Kale. Don't get me started on KLRs, Phil, because you know where well, I'm at on those. <laughs> <laughs> so, again, it is, it is, it is everything that is fucked up about a KLR six fifty and magnificent about a KLR sixty. The versus manages to smooth over by being right. really, really, really fucking good at a lot of things, but. To say that the other bike that you're interested in is a Moto Guzzi V9 Roamer is just totally fucking different. That can't be the same person. It, it just can't. Like, if you have nine motorcycles, you can have a Versus and a V9 Roamer and seven other weird things. But if you only own one motorcycle, you can't come in and say it's either going to be a Versus or a Roamer. So because- to somebody who's listening who doesn't know what the Roma is, the yeah. Roma is, it's kind of not a standard, but it's not a cruiser. It kind of occupies the land between the two, and it's a weird kind of mustard color, and it's either extremely handsome or very ugly, depending on which eye you're using. It's Ooh, the, the spaghetti one you have is like a cream, right? I mean, it's so like the a one white. that I had was the uh, the one I had was the diamond white metallic with red stripes. Okay. And the uh, and and it is, and I'm okay with this. You can call it the spaghetti sportster because <laughs> totally that's kind of what it is. It, it rides a lot like a sportster. The bike really is legitimately. They could have called it a roadster, and they would have been totally okay by calling it a roadster because yeah, it's kind of a weird it. place it occupies. Yeah, and it does feel a lot like an old Yamaha XS650. It does feel like a lot like my old Norton Commando. Like right. when you're going down the road, that's what it feels like. It's a proper roadster. So uh, he did end up buying the V9, and I happened to see him uh, the other day. I was driving into work, and I saw that dude. I was driving a little 660cc fucking weirdo sandbar van. And he's going the other way on the uh, white uh, V9 Roamer. And we, we both knew it was each other. So, like, we're driving weird enough shit that we got a good wave out of it. <laughs> hey, John, why are yeah. you showing me your intakes? Well, I actually, while I have a, an expert, and I'm talking about you, Emma. Hello, Thank darling. <laughs> I'm, holding, I'm holding this rack of CB1 carburetors. Now, nice rack. Your rack. <laughs> nice he rack, to, dog. He needs you to look in his holes. <laughs> oh, I'm <dog>. looking. <laughs> so I've had a lot of carburetors apart and everything, but I'm, I haven't worked on a lot of more modern sport bikes and stuff like that. Okay. So maybe, maybe you've perhaps seen these carbs, and I don't know what you can see there. I'm trying. Let me see if I can get this up to with the right light. So you can kind of see, like, yeah, everything. Everything's at an angle. My question, is, <laughs> my question is this guy right here. So that's where your main jet would be. And then right there would be your pilot jet. And then this is another press-in jet. Right. What's so that's little- your starter. Okay. So the press-in jet is your starter jet. Okay. So when you pull out the choke and you get the enrichment, it gets sucked in through the, the, the press-in jet hole. Now, mm-hmm. they do block... And the classic thing that they block is you pull the choke out and it'll high idle. But the moment you touch the throttle, it'll just die. So you do actually want to clean those out. And the way you clean them out, get a piece You're of just about this, this one right the here. press in jet. Yeah. yeah. So get a piece of wire, um, you know, uh, a piece of electrical wire, copper. I use, I, use, it. I like to use one, one whisker from a wire brush. Right. Perfect. There you go. And get in there and work it, but it's deep. So get what, in there. Don't be scared of it. What is this guy right here? Let me see that. Oh, gee. Okay. That actually does nothing. So what <laughs> they do... <laughs> I, that's I what think I that's, thought, but I'm like, I've never seen that. No, it's, it's, it's plugged. And I think you will find that that is part of uh, a redundant air injection system for the domestic market in Japan. It's a, okay. it's a copper pipe and they just plug it. Right. So you don't okay. need to worry about anything. That taps in, that actually taps into the main jet orifice. 
And for a domestic market bike, it's actually got like an air injection setup. Because the one thing you'll find about your CB1, they are quite dirty. You know, you talk, um, I can't remember who was talking about hydrocarbons. When you're following a CB1 and somebody's getting on it, you'll smell it. Um, so they cleaned it up a lot. So don't worry about that. But just, they're easy enough carburetors. Just make sure, do the starter jets, um, blow through everything with the best quality um, carb cleaner you can find and take your time. They, you'll be fine. Like any small four-cylinder bike, they rely very, very heavily on the carburetors, no really heavily. So get them clean. You'll be fine. They're a lovely little bike. Thank you for holding my hand on that. I really appreciate oh, it. Oh, you're welcome, darling. <laughs> you're welcome. You know, if if I was there in person, I'd be wiggling my finger around in each of your holes, and you know, everything. Oh, oh be my just God. Fine. <laughs> 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 so John, uh, so you know, I was talking to a guy the other. I was I was talking to a guy the other day on the internet. He said the first thing you want to do with those carburetors is immediately just separate them all, get them all away from each other. You know, they shouldn't be on that rack. You know, you gotta if you're gonna show that you're gonna work, you gotta get them all apart. Uh, just oh, just get you. them all away from each other. Yeah, separate them. You don't you don't need to. They don't. Yeah. The uh, we had a we had a bike show up the other day at the shop with a uh, a box. And in the box were all four. Uh, this would have been a, uh, this is a 1981 CB750. And the C 1981 CB750 came in with uh, a box that had all four carburetors perfectly separated. Oh, God. And, and, I basically, <laughs> and I basically told him, I was like, there's nothing I can do to help you, dude. You're, you are super <laughs> <laughs> you are beyond. And You're done. Really, I mean, this guy, he's one of these guys that he had the best of intentions. He was like, well, I knew that, you know, I'd been sitting for a long time, so I had to clean the carburetors. So when I removed the carburetors, oh, God. I thought the best thing I could do is he just took everything apart. I'm going to clean every single little inch of these carburetors. I'm going to take them completely apart and clean everything. Yeah. So... Um, CB750, 1981. Yeah. Right. Perfect. We're very, very close to a large army base. You know, Monterey yeah. is, it's kind of a military town. Yeah, yeah it's a military and town. And so occasionally the soldiers will show up with something interesting. And right now in my workshop, I've got a 1981 CB750. Somebody's done the whole, the whole cafe thing on it right. with a brat seat and all that good shit. But the carburetors, what he's got is a twin Mikuni conversion set for it. And it's from a company called Murray's Carburetors. Okay. Yeah. M-U-R-R-A-Y-S Carbs. Right. So it might be something, you know, you might want to tell the guy with the carburetors, go on to Murray's Carbs, buy yourself a yeah. conversion kit. Yeah, because I've seen that sort of thing for the uh, single overhead cam 750s, where it's like, no, I this is a twin. A yeah. yeah, I gotta tell you, I set them up as best I could, and it sounds good, okay. but it's definitely not as much power as four. Can't mm -hmm. beat four carbs, but sounded good. Yeah. I, I, it's better than the idea of one carburetor going into like an old exhaust manifold, a four cylinder oh exhaust manifold. <laughs> this is, you know, that used to be the exhaust manifold on a car, and now it's an intake manifold on a motorcycle. And one carburetor is trying to feed it all. Right. Uh, we've seen a couple of the conversions for the XS650 that people have done where they're converting an XS650 XS to run on one single carburetor. And, uh, those don't usually work out well. Right. You know, a lot of people, you were talking about your Norton, a lot of people still do the single Mikuni on a Norton. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a good, reliable setup, but it, it doesn't flow anywhere near as much juice as the twin Amels. Um, carb, yeah. Now, my Goldwing, because, you know, I'm still dicking around with a Goldwing Turbo. That thing's got a big, a single 42 mil mm -hmm. pumper going into a crazy looking exhaust manifold and without the turbo hooked up it is flat as a pancake right. but then as soon as i put the turbo on it off it goes yeah. um good god what are we looking at 
John Ace, John's wake up, got a darling. supercharger. This is a uh, Druin supercharger for a CB750. So what it is Look is it's a, it's a four into one plenum. Yes. Go into a supercharger. Wow. And then you have one big carburetor bolts in here. That is correct. So you stuck in there and you blow out there. Yeah. Where Suck, squeeze, bang, blow, darling. Where did you get that? <laughs> How long have you had and that? Then this, <laughs> this pulley is driven off of the crank. The cranks. There's an adapter that goes out the left side of the motor and it turns this pulley. That's fucking marvelous. I love it. Who made that, yeah. John? Druin. D R O U I N. Yeah. Wow. How long have you had it? Over Norton 750 Commandos. Uh, yeah, and realistically, so if anybody knows, John has just been looking for the right CB750 to hook to that supercharger. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, no, you, you've got to buy the accessory first and then buy the bike to match it. I've done that several times. Yeah. Yeah. So that, how rare that's not surprising. It? How rare is that supercharger? On a scale of what? Uh, has anybody on this podcast ever seen one before? No. no. I've never held one in my hands. So that tells you <laughs> kind Chris of. Right. Chris, Chris says he's seen one before. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I'm interested in that, that uh, single carb gold wing. Now, what model yeah. is that? That is a GL1000KO, 1975. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then is it a Weber car? No, it's, it's got a, uh, a Mikuni pumper on it. Um, so this is a bike that came to me about three years ago, and I was given it. I mean, it was a typical large fed. It had saddlebags on it. It had... Um, a light rack it had a giant vetter fairing on it and i really didn't know what to do with it so i took all that crap off and it was quite a good looking bike and then um another friend of mine had a subaru wrx which he rolled and totaled and as a memento we pulled the turbo off it and gave it to me so i thought okay i'll amalgamate the two so it's it's a GL it's a naked GL one thousand with a Subaru WRX turbo on it. <laughs> that's sweet. I mean, that's that was always my goal to throw a, a single carb on a, on one of my GL twelve hundreds because the the four carbs are a pain in the ass and and I would think that, uh, that the, what they were saying is that a, a Volkswagen Weber thirty six thirty six was what you wanted to put on there. So yeah, and um, Randak does the kits. So you can buy the kits for the Webers from Randax, and you can actually buy the Chinese knockoff Webers, and they're only like a hundred bucks a pop. Um, the kits are expensive. You probably, if you've got a pet aluminum welder. The, he could probably make you up a set of manifolds really, really easily. Um, the hot ticket for the GL12 is the is the fuel injection. I mean, as rudimentary as it was, and the ECU for that fuel injection was like the size of a fucking bat, box of cornflakes. But it was a really <laughs> good. It was a really good system. So if you can find, yeah, I, I think one. it was the As it was the Aspen no. Kate that had the fuel injection. Right. Or the interstate, the L, the one LTD, of them. Uh, the LTD in 85 and the SCI in uh, 86. So, Yeah, the SCI, that is a bitching system. So if you're running GL12s, and another hop-up thing for yours, yours has got really, really soft cams and small valves in it. So if you pull the heads and junk them and put the heads from a GL1000 on it, your compression ratio up, it goes up, your valves are bigger and your cams are lumpier and it should give you at least 20 horsepower out the box oh, really? just oh, by awesome. putting GL1000 heads on it. And they're easy to get because everyone's junking GL1000. Right. GL12s are great, but the alternators in them are, Jesus Christ, they're weak. My, my, favorite, my favorite mod is where they drill a hole in the front case and they put a, a standard, uh, like a, a Subaru alternator 
up yeah. underneath of the belt with a, with a can, uh, pulley and a, a belt. It's amazing. Well, you know, the, the big problem with all of these touring bikes from back in the day, it was, it was kind of a comedy of errors because the one thing people wanted to do, they got a big touring bike. Well, what's better than bolting on a load of fucking lights? So now the alternator is working really hard. And a lot of these guys who bought these bikes, you know, routine maintenance wasn't high on their list. <laughs> and so they kind of let the oil go a little bit. And so you've got an alternator that's working really, really hard. And it's an oil-cooled alternator. And the, the bike's so low-stressed, it's not going to grumble when the oil gets really weak. But the alternator will. And the next thing you know, you've cooked it. But the, but the thing is, too, that the, the way the regulators worked is that they just were a huge resistor and they yeah, that's hunted thing into heat. So the alternators always ran at almost 100%. And I guess you're right. If you put more lights on it and they're already running through an alternate or a, a regulator that's taking all the power out of it, then it's going yeah, to Yeah, you're just pulling more through. current through it. And then if right. your oil's like black piss and the engine's running 20, 20 degrees hotter than it really needs to. You know, the, the fact is, if you've got a bike that came with a weak alternator, as long as you're running really good quality synthetic oil and running water wetter in it or whatever, ice water, whatever you want to run in the cooling system and not have it covered in fucking fairy lights, you'll probably <laughs> never have an alternator problem. <laughs> With the, uh, I can I assure you, this yeah, this week has been the week of Suzuki stator failures. So oh we've God. Had, <laughs> we've had in one week, and of course, it's always going to happen in April because guys have parked their bike, and when they parked their bike, they were like, yeah, "It's kind of weird, you know. I need to keep charging the battery or something." And then they park the bike, and they don't do fuck all to it all winter long, and then they bring it out, and they got to jump start it off the Buick or whatever. And uh, so I've got uh, a GSXR 600, GSXR 750, two DRZ 400s all in the shop right now, and a DR650 coming in, all with dead fucking staters. Uh, oh God! They are every single one of them. Suzuki has just—I don't know when Suzuki had ever. What the last year was? Suzuki put a good charging system on a motorcycle. They never have. But, yeah, they never have. And no, they never have. Going, you know, going back to the GS thousand and GS seven fifty, it's all had terrible charging systems. Mark's Electrics right now, um, or Rick's uh, Rick's Electrics, they they are going to get such a check from us because we have this week alone. It's hilarious, but I I've, I've just kind of like. Every time the phone is rung, it's been another Suzuki with a dead charging system. And it's, it's, it is, I'm going to tell you, if you own a Suzuki and you don't keep your battery in good repair, you are asking for a $400 bill at my shop. That is all there is to it. And you're lucky if you get away for $400. Oh, because, that's a bargain. Because I'm going to tell you, but between a stator and a voltage regulator, and we're getting to the point where we're flying on GSXR 600s, and especially, um, we have never seen a good one. When these things come in, they are just barely charging the battery. Well, you know, Suzuki had God. How many recalls for that charging system? Perpetual. It was ju it just, never stopped. It, yeah, it never stopped. I never mean, stopped. if if you if you got good at it, you could make your living just doing the charging systems on Suzuki's. When you were working at the other place, you did a yes. bunch of the uh, Honda CB three uh, hundred R's and Honda CBR three hundreds of the Cranks. new small cranks, yeah. to the crank repair. So yeah. What do you think your time? Well, I do. Wow. No, hang on. I did a mod, yeah. and then I did a mod within a mod. Okay. Because the replacement parts were coming through bad. Yeah. So that was the, so you guys all saw at my shop, we recently took in a, a 2019 Honda CB300R. Yes. We took it in on trade and we yeah. checked the VIN. And of course, with the NHTSA VIN database, you can check any VIN on yes. any bike and see if there's a recall standing. And, and of it's course, not this been bike, done. 
Yeah, this bike had a recall outstanding on it. We checked right. with our local Honda shop, and he's backed up right now about five weeks on this right. repair. So the uh, what do you think your time is? Because I've talked to other people. I've never done one of these. I've oh, you could eat. So here's, there's a, there's a couple of things you need to know about this repair. First thing, has this bike got a full fairing or is it the naked one? It's the naked one. Good. You've just saved yourself half an hour. <laughs> Second thing, <laughs> what finishes on the engine? Has it got the gray with a clear coat on it? Or yeah, is it's it just the gray the with a clear coat. It's the gray with the clear coat. Yeah. You've just added half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a wash. Honda pays 5.9 for that repair. You can... You've got talented wrenches down there. You can easily do it in four. Yeah. However, there is um, there's a repair within a repair, and Honda uh, Honda won't tell you this. So the replacement crank the 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 crank is being replaced because the the case hardening was wrong on the original, but the new cranks come through and all the metals as it should be. But the edges where the crank pin gets pushed in are a tiny bit sharp. And so it was taking out the thrust bearings. So what you do when you get the replacement parts from Honda, you pull the crank out of the bag and you get a Dremel and you run your finger over where the crank pin goes in Mm. on the thrust face and you just put a beveled edge on it. Okay. And that's it. And that's it's, it. Um, it's 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 a quick, easy repair. You've just got to kind of get it into your head that the engine comes out of the bottom, right? But it comes out of the bottom at a weird angle, <laughs> and there's two down tubes that come down the front, and they will gouge the paint on the cylinder. They'll just gouge it. Yeah. And if you've got the grey with a clear coat, right. it's a bitch to touch up. Okay. So. You know, just wrap a load of masking tape around the engine, wrap it around the down tubes, because it's ugly, yeah. you know. But so what's, what's not dicking around with that full fairing. It's like you can spend 20 minutes dicking around with that full fairing and, and still break all the tabs off. So what was the issue with the with the um, the charging with the steer? Is it the, the quality of the winding? Is it the, the coating of, of, of the... Uh, of oh, the on Suzuki's? Yeah. What Suzuki did um, in the uh, in the very very early days, Suzuki had this weird idea about how charging systems worked, and what they did, you'd take a three phase alternator, and Suzuki would send two phases straight to the regulator, and then the third phase they'd have going up through the headlight switch. So when you turned your headlight on, the third phase kicked in. And then right. charged it. And that's how the early bikes used to work. And it was shit. Um, on the later bikes, basically, Jixxers have got undersized regulators. And of course, here in America, our lights are on all the time because they're mandated to be on all the time. So the alternators are working really, really hard. And they're undersized because it's a jigsaw. You want to spin that engine up really, really quickly. So you don't want a giant friggin' flywheel driving a huge alternator on the end. So it's an undersized alternator working a very powerful headlight that's on all the time. And it's just like, I can't handle this. Everything else, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And of course, again, because it's a jigsaw and it's very, very tight, the only place to put the regulator rectifier is stuck on the inside of the frame, very, very close to the headers. So the thing's being fucking cooked (laughs) when it should be cold. So it's just like a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. Um, You know, it's, yeah. um, You put Suzuki... You put something with a heat sink right next to a heat source, and rather than giving off heat, it's taking in heat. Yeah. Right. I can't imagine why that failed. Right. It's, it's, go figure. Um, you know, many years ago, 
I had a wonderful English contraption called a Jensen Interceptor. <laughs> and a Jensen Interceptor is quite a small car with a giant 440 Chrysler in the front. You know, and it, it basically produced a lot of noise and it produced a lot of heat. But the electrics on that car are just wretched. And part of the problem is the battery gets cooked because it lives right. in the same compartment of the engine. And so... Um, a lot of the people, I mean, this, this car is from 45 years ago. Right. So a lot of people in the meantime have figured out the best place for a Jensen Interceptor battery is in the trunk. Right. So you'd buy this conversion kit and you'd have these giant leads that go all the way from the bulkhead into the trunk yeah. and your battery would live in the trunk and mysteriously, half of your electrical problems would go away. Yeah. But was that Lucas? Um, yes, of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> well, it's not Chrysler, it's Lucas. However, in Lucas's defense, <laughs> the joke is in England is Lucas Electrics by about the late 80s had gotten good and Heller, the German people, were happy to take up the mantle and produce the shittiest electrics in the, in the world after Lucas had taken over. Oh, look at those Jensen Interceptors. Those are marvelous. I th my favorite is that dark bronze color. That, that, is, uh, that is to me, if anybody ever says Jensen. I'll go get it when I'm done. Yeah, if anybody ever says Jensen Interceptor to me, that is just the color that I think of. Scroll right. down, so, scroll down some of the images on the yeah. left. Yeah. Um, because I think my car might be amongst them. It. Uh, but keep going down, keep going yeah. down. If these are just the standard stock pictures, these are my cars amongst these. Yeah, yeah there's mine. Um, if you stop, if you say, oh no, that's the Australian one. Mine looked exactly the same as the one for car sales Australia. The blue, the this blue one. one. Oh, yeah. That's the, that looked exactly the same as mine. Same Gorgeous. color, with yeah. a cream interior. Yeah. Nice looking car. We but went to look at one up in Ontario. Uh, my friend and I had a wild hair up our ass that we were going to go buy an interceptor. And then when we looked at it, and it was one of those things that, you know, we'd driven miles to go see this thing. And it was in just outside a suburb of Toronto, Ontario. And right. And when we got there and looked at it, we were just like, you know what? We are pretty heroic. Like we've done triumphs. We've done TR sixes. We're willing to do a really weird car, but that fucking interceptor was just, you could tell that 19 different people had come up with the idea of putting a Chrysler big block V eight motor into this really kind of an interesting car, but that at no point did they have a meeting and say, okay, well we all need to work together on this. It was pretty much like, I'm just going to, okay, I'm in charge of just putting the motor there. Okay, now right. your job is to put the suspension around it. So I'll share with you two of the greatest Jensen Interceptor stories. And um, one of them's mine. It's very, very quick. I, I can promise you that I got every item of electrical componentry on my Interceptor working. Wow but never at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> nice. The second, awesome. the second, is awesome. which, is a, which is a wonderful story. <laughs> so the Jensen Interceptor had this huge Chrysler 440 stuffed inside, and it was very, very close to the uh, firewall, the bulkhead of the car. Oh, look at that, look at that, look how rusty that is. Isn't that wonderful? So what Jensen did to basically stop you getting cooked inside was to put a load of um, foil-covered asbestos on the front of the fly, uh, bulkhead, fireball. The trouble is the glue they used was flammable. So what had happened is the, the header had burned through the foil and burned through the asbestos, get to the glue, and then that was flammable. <laughs> so this guy in the Jensen Owners Club, a very, very good friend of mine, a guy called Kevin McCracken, he parked his car in the garage at night, <laughs> turned off, went inside the house, the exhaust burnt through the asbestos, right. set the firewall on fire. Right. 
and so the car is actually on fire yeah. however the fire burnt through one of the AC hoses and the Freon put the fire out damn <laughs> They designed it that way. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> the self-extinguishing Jensen. Yeah. So he went out He went out to his car in the morning, and there was a wonderful little singed part on the hood, and he opened the hood, and there was a burn spot just surrounded by frozen Freon. So it was gonna clear ask, what had happened. I mean, you know, what a story. What do you use to extinguish flaming asbestos? <laughs> yeah, Freon. Who'd have thought? Really? <laughs> I have to ask you a question, though, since you own that Jensen. The, the Chrysler 440 wedge heads had yes. such a great sound when they were winding out. I mean, I, oh, I, yeah. it was a beautiful, beautiful sound. It was, and they, I, I defy anyone. That that's a great sounding engine. The big problem in the Jensen, it was a, basically a very very lightweight car, and it had a tubular space frame chassis with a very lightweight body put on top of it. And a lot of people think they were aluminum. Believe me, they were steel, and they rusted like hell. Um, but the big problem I had, because, of course, I like the sound of the, the 440 myself, so I'd have loud exhaust on it. The thing would just resonate like crazy. So you really had to be careful what exhaust you put on. There's nothing that sounds like a 440. No. And it's funny, you know, you've got, like, the 383, which became the 440. Right. But they sound so different. No, no, there's no comparison. I mean, the 440s had, had the best sound at Redline. I don't, I don't know what it was about them. But they sounded better than the 426s, I think. But Oh, God, yeah. And, you know, the 426, and it, they made great power, but they weren't that good a sounding engine. I mean, no. you know, I'm going to upset a lot of people right now, but in my opinion, the 426s sounded, sounded like somebody banging two trash can lids together. Yeah. You know, and if, if you like that noise, that's great. I don't. I prefer something that actually sounds... A, a lot meatier and the 440 was a meaty sounding engine incidentally the jensen did a limited edition one called the sp which stood for the six pack which had the the mm. triple deuces the on trips. it yeah yeah um mine had um a thermo quad on it which right. is the plastic bowl yep. and i was actually i will have stand up and defend the thermo quad it was actually if you knew how to set them up it's a good carb well, what would you think of that Jensen with a 340 in it? I mean, that might have been a better combination because that, you know, uh, in, yeah, 150 pounds lighter and <laughs> and so on and so forth. We bringing it back to what we were talking about at the beginning of the show. The thing is with the Jensen, and the thing is with small capacity two stroke singles. It was a car of the time. When you go back to the early 70s, there were a ton of these things about. There wasn't just the Jensen. There was the De Tomaso. Um, right. There was the ISO. Yep. There was the Pantera. Yep. There was just a ton of these big hybrid, yeah. exotic European cars which they didn't have the money to develop their own engines like Aston Martin did. Right. So you just bought these big horsepower American yeah. engines. You big a big back in the all these things yeah. were was giant cast iron, seven hundred and ninety pound, a thousand pound V eight motors that right. were being shipped across to England or Italy and being like I hate to say it, but like just dumped into these really cool chassis and these really cool sports cars. And you'd have this really big truck engine sitting back there. Right. And everyone was like, go. Yeah. So his it's so you, you remember the Disney film cars when that oh, came yeah. out. Yeah. So I always, back when that car first came out, I still had the Jensen and I thought, so, you know, what would the, what would the Jensen be like in cars? <laughs> so you'd, you'd, you'd have, 
Well, you know, you'd have the Jensen pull up. You'd right. have the Jensen pull up, and you'd be, oh, I say, how, how are you? It's awfully nice. And then you'd hear this kind of thumping from under the hood. Yeah. And the Jensen, he'd start looking really embarrassed. And, oh, got to go. And then the hood would fly open. And then Arby would come out of the hood and be, dang, boy! You talk funny! <laughs> what do you think of the scarab? You need to start speaking English. Yeah, exactly. Well, the scarabs were interesting. Interesting, because if that's two forty Z with a three fifty in it, right? Three fifty in it. 20, yeah. three twenty seven. Yeah. yeah, they they were actually made in LA, um, and they did really really well. I don't know, you know, I I have kind of strong points of view with original Jags as well. Right. The two forty Z is a six cylinder car. Right. And there's something very, very, very alluring about a six cylinder car. There's something very creamy and smooth about it's in it. In line six, right? Yeah. It's in right. Line six. Yeah. Just as the original Jags were. Right. No, I and agree. I mean I agree because I have a I have an E three. So right. I mean I have a Bavaria. Right. right, which is an inline six. In six. And that's a yeah. lovely, just, there's something nice about right. a creamy inline six. And yeah, if you put a V8 in a 240Z, it's going to make good power and it's going to sound good. But you kind of lose a lot of the character of the car. It's the same if you've ever driven one of the original Jag XJ6s with a V8 conversion. They're great because they make good power. And it really, you know, it changes the car a lot, but not necessarily for the better. It's a lot more coarse of a car. They vibrate more. They resonate more. Yeah, no, the sixes are, are uh, harmonically balanced. And yeah, exactly. And, you know, I like the noise of a six. My, you know? my uh, neighbor's got an XK150. Yeah, yeah, you see. Six is a massive six. I mean, that is the biggest six cylinder I've ever seen in my life. Well, it, it's got, you know, there are often people, you'll open the hood and they say, oh, that's a Y, that's a V6. And of course it's not, but it almost looks like one because the cams are splayed so far apart. Right. But that engine dates back to 1947. How wild is that? And you're talking about a 40 year production run because. That engine finished in 1987, but you can take parts from an 87 and bolt them onto a 47, and you can take parts off a 47 and bolt it onto an 87. Oh. And yeah, they're fundamentally different engines, but they're basically the same motor. Isn't that wild? It's like the Harley of uh, England. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a great motor. But interesting enough, and we'll, we'll go for another walk right now, um, <laughs> because yeah, here we go. We're, go. we're going walkies. Yeah. So, um, we're going through the kitchen. Tra -la -la, da -da -da -da. It's, it's still light here in California. It is not so, here. We're, uh, no, I'm sure it's dark. We're quarter so, 10 here. So, the, so uh, here we are in Emma's garage and let me see, cause I'm kind of, okay. So there's my goosey. That's good. Yeah, that's my that's my V11 that started off life as a as a California. Right. But I wanted to show you there's the Jag. Yeah. Yeah, that's so, what I kind of noticed it earlier. Yep. <laughs> yeah, so there's my Jag. Do you like the license plate? I do. Yeah. But what I wanted to show you is a factory car. Where are we? Even Jag went to uh. it. Uh, <laughs> it's a Jag V8. It's a Rover. But it's a V8 now. Yeah. yeah. So, um, what else have I got in here? Is that one? Uh, is that That's, one Ford bottom? Yeah, it's it's post Ford. Yeah, it's post Ford, and Ford really had a lot more to do with the smaller ones. The XJ8s, they pretty much left them on their own. So I've got a 50 BSA in there. Right. That's a Firebird Scrambler which is in for paintwork, hence it's got no paint on it. And then, oh, hey. KTM two-stroke. Look at that expansion hey. chamber. Yeah. Yeah. Brap, brap. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And then um, there you go. Tiger Cub up in the rafters. Right, right. And then Montessa. So, yeah. There you go. Where's, oh. the go- Where's the gold wing at, Miss Emma? Oh, the gold wing, unfortunately, is, I've actually got that at work because it occupies so much real estate. Um, I'll send you guys a picture of it. In fact, I'll tell you what, Phil. Yeah. If I send you a picture to your phone of it right now, can yes. you put it up for the guys? I can do. Oh, yeah. right. Okay. Yeah. So you guys would be happy to know that uh, in the in, in yet another Brexit story or a story of England, <laughs> England, just England. a strange place. Um, it is England. So we all have one thing in common, and that is we are no longer subjects of the crown. But <laughs> Norton, in the giant fuck you to England, Norton factory, Norton's castle, Norton has been bought by the Indian. India. India. I was going to say, for judge. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Phil, I just sent you a picture of the wing. The, All right. The seat is as a yet upholstered, right, unupholstered, right. so it's got, the, um, it's got the foam seat on it. Okay. The shape's pretty much where I want it to be. Did you text that to me, Emma? Uh, I sent it to you via Messenger. Via Messenger. Okay, I'll take care so of that. So if you look on Messenger... I'll get it up there for us. Oh, cheers. You're yeah. so much more technically advanced than me, darling. Can do, will do. The, uh, but I thought that was just hilarious that Norton is now owned by Inja. So, well, it, it, Jaguar is owned by uh, Tata Motors. Tata, so yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's India's an interesting market. Yeah. Um, they outsell pretty much everybody else and there's yeah. all these domestic bikes that we know nothing about yeah. um and of course who owns, who owns uh, harley because i don't know it was it was a company that's not from the u.s there was someone from was it india as well so uh, if you guys want to take up take oh there the you go there she is there she is so there we have a uh there, there we got a ko but it's not like a ko anybody around here has ever drop their eyes on so um i'll run you through it front to back okay um if we start off at the front end the front forks are actually off a concourse yep um the triple trees are off a gl 1200 sure sure yeah, one of the 40 ones. Yep. The rotors yep. are early Jixa. Yeah. Because I are. like the round holes. I like mm-hmm. the round, big round holes. Yeah, they look great. The, the, cali- your over here. the calipers are four part <laughs> off an old um, ZXR 750. Yep. The yep. front rim is a 17 inch. And it's a back rim off my Moto Guzzi. I was going to say it looks about four inches wide. It's three and a half. Yeah. And it's got a one twenty seventy. Right. Um, the front fender's Harley, yeah. and the the bridges I made myself. I was going to say those are thick as fuck. Well, I wanted it. I wanted it to have a certain elegance, but I well, wanted but it, it also, to be burly as well. And it also acts as a fork brace. Yes, exactly. And it, yeah. I can hang the fender off it. Yeah. So if we go back to, um, there's a giant, in- I'm going to send you another picture of the intercooler, which is missing off that. So okay, the yeah. shelter is off an 1100. Mm-hmm. And then just below the shelter, you can see the polished aluminum and rubber pipe. That yep. feeds the intercooler. And I the think turbo, that came from you Kirby Vacuum see. Cleaner Company. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and then you, if you look just in front of the rear wheel, right? that's the... Um, keep go, go down, go down, go down, like go the down. Ca- Sapporo catch can is a good touch. Sapporo catch can. Yeah. Um, like that's the wastegate, waste and yeah, I've got twin waste wastegates on it. Yep. There's your dump. Um, and then the back wheel is yeah. actually the... It's a standard... Goldwing hub and disc, but I drilled the disc to match the front. Yep. And then the back rim is off a super glide. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And that's a five inch rim. Again, we're running 17 inch rubber. Wow. 
Yeah, perfect. I mean, that is that's exactly it. You went with the original uh, OEM turn signals, and the- well, I, I mean, they're so much a part of the bike. They are exactly. Yep. Um, and I wanted to keep them, and you know, it's the same. The back fender is off. Um, an early 750 Honda. Yep. I made the tail light bracket. Right. The actual tail light itself is a a vintage. I think a, a trailer tail light. <laughs> oh, CB seventy eight, seventy eight, seventy four K. Oh, yeah. I sent you that picture, Phil. This uh, no, that's the seventy. That's my first. That's the first motorcycle I ever had in America. Was the seventy eight seven fifty four K. Yeah. Well, I sent you that picture. Yeah. That's the, that's the one I restored for Reggie Jackson. Yeah. That's Reggie that's- Jackson's bike. Yeah, and interestingly my, was... enough, the Yamaha TX behind it, yep. that is the gas tank that's on the Guzzi. And in oh, fact, really? I'm going to send you a picture of the Guzzi right now because it didn't really come through on my phone. So I've sent you, there's the, right, there's, there's the inter- intercooler. There's a cooler. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's cool. That's and then nice. I just sent you a picture of the Guzzi which is the gas tank from the TX500, right. which is also, um, do you remember the Misfits calendar where I'm in bed with a bike? Absolutely. That is the bike. How could we possibly forget that? So the TX500 behind, that is the bike I'm in bed with for the Misfits calendar. Right. Fucking cool. But yeah, that CB750 came out pretty well. That's, there you go, there's my goosey. Yeah, and that looks fantastic. That is the best looking California ever that v11 is fucking great well you know it's like what the hell do you do with a california i You're mean it's it's not a good looking thing is it no nope, it's not and the, the v11 california is one of those things that is just there's nothing sexy about it at all well mine unfortunately was the ugliest of them all because it was right. a california titanium yep well that and, yeah, yeah yeah and that's just gruesome yeah, and that's and that really is. It is tragic. The uh, we've had this uh, we've had this Gucci at our shop for ages, and we can't get anyone to fucking play with it. We can't get anyone to look at it. It's really bad. And meanwhile, the bike is sound as a pound. It's a really really good bike, but it's just it's just fucking unsellable. Nobody wants to look at it. Nobody wants to buy it. And I'll keep- oh, you've got me going now. I want to see it. Oh but yeah, well, I'll, I'll, I'll pull Phil, it off. Phil, when I'll you, as soon as you say nobody wants to buy it, that makes me want to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, yeah. Phil. It's Come on now. Bad. I want to see this motor goose. I'll pull it up. Give me it's a second. Just a weird seating position, though. It does have a weird seating position. You're exactly it's got right. The floorboards where your feet are too far forward. Yeah, yeah, that's that's absolutely true. You know what and I call that? I call that the sitting on the toilet <laughs> seating position. It's like sitting on the crapper. <laughs> it really is. It's it's really unfortunate. I mean that that bike is got. It runs perfectly. I've had it up to over 125 miles per hour. It is. There's nothing mechanically wrong with that thing at all. I mean, at oh, you've all. got a you've got a Spaniard. Yeah. Oh, you've, I've got a Spaniard. Yeah. There's a there's a goose. Yeah. There you yeah, go. Yeah, you got a Spanish goose. Yeah, what a, a handsome goose. bike. Yeah, that's a uh, that's the F2. So it's got the full fairing. Yeah. Um, and it's cheap as chips. I mean, yeah. There's there's really nothing. That's a lot of bike for somebody, and I I, I like them. They've just they've got gruesome carburation on them, but they're they're great <laughs> bikes. The century, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they really do. So um, you want me to talk you through this one? Oh, <laughs> the uh, here I'm going to pull this up real quick just so people can see it, so we can just we can stop talking about it. We'll just we'll just yeah. I got to see it. I got to yeah, see this. Uh, I, I've just got. I, I want to br- bring this. Nobody Gucci does up. ugly like Moto Guzzi Cruisers. I'm telling you, this <laughs> thing is just a tragedy of a motorcycle. Oh, I can see it now. Oh, yeah. So. Ah! Good news is it doesn't have the ketchup and mustard paint scheme. Uh, But the bad news is that if you look at this, this thing is just like somebody showed a picture of a Harley Davidson to a an Italian guy, and look at the like the the woeful front fender, the front fender with a little kick in the back of it. 
And the good news is the giant GV boxes hide the ridiculously terrible back fender. But what I'm, you, I'm, I'm going to stick my neck out here, actually, yeah. Phil. Yeah. I think that is better looking than mine was when I got it. Oh, only because it's not a fake titanium color, right? <laughs> because this well, is no, I mean, color. you know, that's got no pretension of being anything other than a cruiser. Right. The exactly. titanium, it's a cruiser with like a bikini fairing on it yeah. and just this ridiculous cladding on the rear fender. This motorcycle um, is absolutely beautifully well behaved. It rides perfectly. The riding position is actually quite comfortable, but it is so fucking ugly. And this gas tank, I hate this gas tank. This gas tank is unforgivable. Yeah, yeah, I've, I have the, I've, got the, I've got the same gas tank from my old titanium hanging up in the rafters of the garage. The back of the gas tank is lower than the front of the gas tank, and that's a fucking sin. Uh, it's just, yeah, this bike is, and of course the one taillight wasn't bad enough. They had to double it and they just, it's just, there's nothing from a stylish standpoint, from a styling standpoint, this bike is a fucking train wreck, but mechanically and running, it is delightful. And it no, works I wanna, great. I want to buy it so badly now. Oh my God. Emma. Piper, yeah. my daughter Piper likes your accent. She said, who is that talking? I said, that's... Where, that. where, where, where's, where's Piper? I want to say hi to Piper. Yes, where's Piper? Where's Piper? Uh, hi, Piper. Hello, darling. I like your NASA T-shirt. Oh, thank you. How old are you, darling? What? How old are you? I'm 13. 13? That's a very good age to be. <laughs> <laughs> Not for Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's a good kid. I trust her. More than no, I should. she. No, she looks. She looks a good kid. But what change is going on, dear? So uh, hold on to your hat, darling. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I I believe you. <laughs> but I tell you what, if if. If there was a bike that I was going to buy from you, Phil, and ride back to California, yeah. that goosey would be the perfect one. Yeah, it, it's but, California. <laughs> yeah, it's the big, the lazy. They actually yeah. make decent power. Yeah. Um, but God, they are so gruesome. They're ugly. It's just, it's one of those bikes that every time I ride it, I can't, there's nothing about it I can hate. The brakes work fantastic. It's triple Brembo's and they're linked. The drivetrain is great. There's no slop in it. It goes like the devil. It's got plenty of torque and it idles and it goes like the power is a flat power curve. It's right. really good just the way it is. The fuel injection is spot on. There's not a hiccup in this single thing. It's perfect. But it is like when you look over at the window at the store and you see a reflection of yourself sitting on it. No, fuck it, man. You just want to get off the bike right there. And <laughs> so even a good looking guy with a white streak in his beard couldn't pull it off. <laughs> <laughs> So that's why you get bonus points, Emma, for making a, a V11 California into a really good looking bike. Because like your yeah, bike but is. Here's, but here's the deal. Yeah. If you take all that shitty fuel tank off right. and the side panels off in the seat, right. you've got the, the Tonti frame. Right. There's the a classic frame. goozy frame. So exactly right. the sky's the limit. Yeah. The biggest problem I had with my goozy was getting the injection right because I was going from an in-tank fuel pump right. to a remote fuel pump, and I just couldn't get it right. I got it right in the end. What did you end uh, up doing with that? Which pump did you source? Did you get a automotive pump? No, I used a Hayabusa one. Hayabusa pump, yeah. A Gen 1 Hayabusa, and the reason I wanted the Gen 1 Hayabusa is it's a remote pump, but it lives in its own reservoir of fuel. Because what people don't realize with fuel injected bikes the fuel pump lives in the fuel tank for a reason it's liquid the fuel cool. is keeping the pump cool yeah, it's liquid cool and if you just run a separate fuel pump it'll cavitate like crazy exactly and that's the problem i was having even with automotive fuel pumps right. so the the higher boost is an interesting setup it's it's like a giant cigar shaped thing mm -hmm. um 
with a pump inside it and it's living in its own chamber of fuel. Right. And so I, I hid that underneath the left hand side panel and it works great. It it's feeds out a lot of juices. Yes, it's <laughs> marinating in its own juices and it gets fed from the left side of the tank and it pumps back into the right side of the tank and it's brilliant. Yeah. And I love that thing. And I just put the tail fairing on it. For a long time, I was running a, just a stock dual seat yeah. and I put the tail fairing from, um, I think that was off a Ducati Monster and I just had it color, color matched to it and it looks great. Yeah, that's that's one of those things that there are to rescue a V11 California. You just that's that's kind of that's just one of those deals where you're like, okay, that's that's totally the right thing to do because I think I've got that bike in my showroom. I think I've got it down to like twenty five hundred bucks. Oh God yes. Almighty! It's I know. such a great bike for twenty five hundred yeah. bucks. I'm almost tempted to go out, buy it, ride it home, and build another one and fix it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> fix it into something worth looking fix at. It. <laughs> you know, that was um, that was going to be. That's one of those things that you could do a mid Ohio project, and you could start the weekend with the V11 like that one, and then, and then end the, it, and over the course of the weekend, end up with a much better bike. <laughs> Exactly. By just removing all the Gucci parts and selling those off and then buying shit at mid Ohio to build that bike into a much more interesting machine. I mean, what are your thoughts on mid Ohio? Do you think they, they're going to have to pull the plugs? They have to, later? because I just don't see that because mid Ohio is like what? 10,000, 15,000 people over the course of two or three days. And if nothing else, it's just that density of people in one space that will cause it to get canceled the hell with you know yes we could ramble around and we could not sneeze on each other or we could not porta potties porta potties two words right porta potties how would you feel about using a porta potty at mid ohio right now right. right yeah and that's true and as as much as i i feel like i understand from a military standpoint the idea of like how diseases spread and how you protect yourself from them and just the same. I feel like I could do that and I could get away with mid Ohio and I would be okay, but I just don't feel like 10,000, 15, 20,000 people could do that. Right. And they can't have the liability of being when Jack, uh, when Jackie said that like Sturgis is on, that's where one of those things you're like, Oh my fucking God, you can't tell me that Sturgis is on when Isle of man closed. So right. like Isle of man, the track is 37 fucking miles long and you could spread out and have, you know, you could have 200 meters of social distancing at Isle of man. No problem. Oh, you can, if, if, if you want at the Isle of Man, you yeah. can station yourself in a pub and be surrounded by fans and have that experience. Yeah. Yeah. Conversely, if you get up early enough right. and get on your motorcycle and yeah. ride halfway around the island, yeah. you can pick a spot where you're the only person. Exactly. Yeah. Oscar and I made the mistake of walking about 17 miles from a place where we were like, this is a good viewing spot, but if we just walk down the road a little bit, we can get to another viewing spot. Oh, that's how it gets you. But we didn't realize that walking down the road was legit like five or six miles. And right. at any point there, we could have stopped and had bikes going past us at 140, 150 miles per hour. Right. But we instead decided to go and, and move on. But you know, Isle of Man is one of the few events where I feel like you could actually participate or see the event without being on top of the guy next to you. If like they would close places like the Raven or whatever. right. But as you point out, they've closed. And I, I, I think truthfully, as much as it breaks my heart to say so, you know, 2020 is going to be, is written off yes, as is. far as motorcycle and social gathering. Yeah. And I think we just have to look forward to 2021. And it is, it's going to be an absolute riot. I did people are just going to uh, go bulls out for it. I bought some Isle of Man 2020 souvenirs for Oscar and me. So, right. oh, that's collectible. I went yeah. on the I went on the TT website and they had some they had some items that were already printed up and they were selling them off. So I grabbed some stuff for I grabbed some stuff because I was like, you know, um, here on my hat I've got my pass for Isle of Man and uh, 
So we all the uh, museums and stuff for all the museums and all the stuff in town. And it is, it's just one of those things you're like, damn it, man. But it does, it does again, it calls to you and says like, okay, so for next year, you know, uh, yeah, I think you got to kind of have to go to that one. Right? You know, so it's a tough, uh, it's a tough thing for everybody. So I don't now, think the, the, I don't this know. seems like we're talking about larger events right now. Uh, what, what, what do you think about smaller events though? Like, do you think stuff like yeah, stuff like scooter rallies, yeah. we're not drawing in tens of thousands of people. Right. Yeah. Where do you think we're going to be standing with stuff like that? Well, band camp would be a really good example. If you're talking about a rally, like a legendary, a legendary rally in our community would be band camp and band camp is, you know, if you come out with COVID, is it better than herpes? You know, is it, is it, is it better than Ghana syphil, you know, chlamydia? Uh, it's probably better than the uh, broken rib and uh, hangover for three days. That's for sure. And that's, and that's exactly it. I, I know that there are, th- there are some things where like when you, when you think about that and you do an event that is going to be 150 people or, you know, tops 150 200 people tops and it's spread out over a space that's you know 15 acres or 16 acres yeah you could still absolutely have social distancing sure but the point is if if i'm johnny normal person and i'm up there trying to social distance and uh johnny mecklefresh decides that i need a hug at 3 30 in the morning yes he does <laughs> he's all right <laughs> I don't even see, but you know what, if you're going to go to, if you're going to go to something like band camp, yeah. just forget about it. Right. Go there, have a good time, enjoy yourself, know that you're exposing yourself, yep. hope that you don't get it bad and you're just rolling the dice because it would be silly to try to do Sturgis or band camp right. or any of these things. We're trying to wrap yourself in a full body condom and, and not, you know, and, and try to keep people with, from six feet away from you. That's right. just not going to Maybe it's just the idea that you do something like that and then you quarantine your ass for 14 days once you get home. Well, I mean, I mean, could you really, well, it'd be interesting, but I mean, could you have a mass quarantine beforehand? Everybody quarantine the fuck out of themselves, you know, like 14 days. Oh, and save yourself up for it. Yeah, yeah, I like the sound of that. <laughs> but you know, I mean, the, the 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 fact of the matter is, with a couple of exceptions, yeah. every single person on this podcast is 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 in a high risk group. Yes, yeah, you know, because of age, because of lifestyle choices. I think it's the only safe one. Nick is the only safe one. <laughs> Dan, I, I'm around the same age as Nick too, so I, I'm pretty oh, safe here. Guys. And Dan and Nick. I think Dan and Nick are the only ones that are actually quote. Well, safe. Did you have a chance? Did you have a chance to see uh, check your Facebook today? Uh, yeah, which w- yes. I'm talking about Amanda and Mark. Oh, not really. No, go ahead. I had no idea, but she posted today that she's been off work for 23 days. That she yeah, had- and Mark had it. Yeah, that she said she started. Right. She was sick, and then Mark got it and spent. You know, took two trips to the hospital and. Right. Oof. I, don't like yeah, I mean, that's the, that's the thing is when people are, there's a lot of activity right now. I mean, we're not going to go full disease, but keep in mind that in our group that we know people, I know, I know now six people. So I know six people that have it, have been hospitalized for it. Wow. And have, are going through some sort of recovery. Right. So, there's six people and these aren't people that had like a runny nose and a cough for like four days and then everything was cool. We know people that have been extremely laid up for this for like 23, 25, 29 days. That's amazing. So this is not a fucking walk in the park. No, absolutely not. So, yeah. And you know, in California, certainly where I'm at, and I know it's a very different experience if you to go to LA or San Francisco, but sure. to a certain extent, Monterey and Santa Cruz are mirroring it. Mm-hmm. They're smaller towns. We don't live on top of each other, which is great. Um, our governor took very, very aggressive steps very early on. And 
I think we, we're doing quite well with it so far. Right. Um, and I don't know whether you've been listening to Misfits. I mean, me and Liza are going backwards and forwards as to whether should we be riding our bikes? Should we even be going out on our bikes? And our attitudes are changing week by week. Yeah. Um, and I'm really not sure where I'm at on it. I mean, the weather is beautiful today. I was pulling my hair out. If it's like this tomorrow, fuck it. I'm going out on the bike. <laughs> the Japanese has said that that you have an 18.7% or 18.7 times chance less of getting it outside than you do inside. I'll take that risk. So why wouldn't you ride? I mean, that's where we were. Right. Well, I mean, the argument we were having over at, over at Misfits is if you were to wreck, and there's no doubt about it that people are pretty distracted right now right. so granted there are a lot fewer cars on the road but the cars on the road the standard of driving is pretty shit oh, i just rode because, a 30 a 30 car wreck on 90 like right hours or three hours ago i was yeah. right got a couple of growlers there were 30 cars wrecked on the road i had to drive through the debris because right. people are distracted so less cars on the road but it's bad standard of driving so if you were to wreck let's say the worst happens and you wreck do you really want to be in a hospital nope no, but here's the thing, though, that I've learned from most hospitals, because my wife works at Case and it's next to U8, whatever. Anyways, um, they're separating most of the emergency stuff from all the COVID stuff. So Agreed. Yeah, and there's like, so they're keeping less staff in emergency, right. whatever, but you're definitely not going to see any COVID patients walking into that area. They have people directed differently. But then you get into the morals of it, right. yeah. and it's like hospitals right now, Generally, they're scrambling, and do you want to add to that? Right. Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I, I'm just putting it out there that literally I will get up on a Thursday and I will think I'm the worst person in the world for wanting to ride my bike. Yeah. On Friday, I'm like, I'm the worst person in the world for not riding That's my riding bike. <laughs> I mean, forgive me, but I've never been through this before, so I'm not really sure how to ri- how to react. Um, you have a point in that regard. We've been riding every weekend. We try to go out once a weekend and ride as a group or some of us or whatever. But right. for our rides, we talk beforehand and we kept it really mellow. Because we're like, we don't want the statistic. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, it was, very, it was a much more relaxed, kind of just chilling ride. You know, nobody was risking anything. Nobody's hitting turns hard or anything. So even if we fell, I don't think anybody was going in an ambulance. You know what I mean? Like, we all had yeah. all that kind of stuff, so. And I think, truthfully, that is the most responsible way to approach this, because... (laughs) That um, Eliza is killing me. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, God. I know. Um, I think she was about 14 when that picture was taken. I mean, you can see there's so much hope for the future in that picture, right? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't broken. Um, yeah, it, is, it, all, it all went, it all went pear-shaped very quickly. A lot um, of questions for the future, though, too. Yes. Yes. A lot of questions, some of which would remain unresolved all her life. Thank the Lord. Um, you know, yeah... <laughs> From a mental health standpoint, I mean, not riding my bike is doing my head in. So, you know, if I don't want to start eating the back of my hand or smashing up the furniture, I think I need to ride my bike. Just go out and ride and be done with it. I mean, you're taking a risk. If, if If there's no COVID, if it's any other day, you're taking the same risk on the road. So just ride. Think about this. Think about this. It really, if you really want to get down to it, a lot of people that are saying don't go ride your motorcycles are probably making dinner, right? And you can be cutting a tomato and you can slice an artery in your hand cause <laughs> just as much trauma as most of a motorcycle accident. What kind of hands do you have? Slice an artery. These tomato hands. <laughs> so, artery in your hands. I'm saying, <laughs> other ways. so make 
Oh, well, make no mistake. I am the oldest person here, and not by a small amount either. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So, hey, Chris whoa. Smith. Whoa, 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 young lady. Yeah. We, got, we got a couple. We got okay. Couple. Okay, let's cut them open and count the rings. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Oh, my. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Thank um, you. Let's 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 dovetail to the youngest person. Right. Who's the youngest person in the room right now? Nick. No. I'm 27. Okay. Yeah. What's your perspective? Um pretty much the same as ever. Well, I mean, I'm skewed a little bit because I hang out in my garage which is full of all sorts of dangerous shit. So Yeah. Like, I see I'm that Vespa out back out there, bud. Yes. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at that green Vespa. Thing. That is a fucking death trap if ever I saw yeah. it. <laughs> so, so if I'm out on a motorcycle, that's probably no more dangerous than all of the other stuff that I would be doing anyways. Uh, right. I, I mean, I've hurt myself in a wide variety of, of ways, and I've never really hurt myself so badly on a motorcycle that I've ended up in a hospital. Yes. I gotta um, say, Nick, that pink bicycle with a basket on it, that could hurt your feelings quite badly. <laughs> <laughs> because it's hurting your feelings. <laughs> I, it's only because I want to ride it, darling. <laughs> <laughs> Smile when you say that. Now, speaking of the Vespa, what's the status on that, Nick? I know, I know you dropped uh, it, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it seized at about 60 miles an hour. Oh, nice. Uh, and so it's banged up a little bit, but it runs, and I might ride it tomorrow. We'll see. Right on. Nice. Primo. We're riding small stuff tomorrow, so. Yeah, yeah. Yep. It's either that or the, the Superhawk, and people were yelling at me last time for the Superhawk not really being all that small. <laughs> oh, that's, you ride the Superhawk. That's a beautiful bike. Oh, God, that Superhawk is so handsome. It's finally got a good owner. Ah, there you go. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank so, you, Mr. Uh, Trump. <laughs> so, so let's get down to brass tacks. Who's gonna, who's going to ride tomorrow? Stick your hand up. Yeah. One, two, three, I'm, four. I'm skipping it. I'm skipping it, but I've done it before so, with the guys. So I was, okay, I was five. Yeah. Me, me, me. Yeah. So who's riding the two-stroke tomorrow? Chris. Me, me, me. <laughs> so here's I'm gonna take that KTM out. Yeah, there's a, there's a bit of a problem with me committing to riding tomorrow because, of course, I'm, I'm working. And uh, it, what I was talking about today, I was speaking with Renee and I said, hey, here's an idea. If I say that I'm going to go riding at 6 p.m., I will get a fucking deluge of customers at like 5 that will run me late to like 6.45, 7 right? Good strategy for making money. Meanwhile, if I say, you know, oh no, I'm not going to ride. You guys all ride. Like, you know, has happened every fucking week is that you guys ride on Saturday and that I can't go ride with you. So I, I see you in my parking lot, smoking cigarettes and bullshitting. And <laughs> I'm sitting inside like with my nose against the glass. Fucking man, you know, I wish I could go and play with these fucking guys, you know? <laughs> I, I, I fucking, it sucks. But like, if you do it during the, the, the early hours and I can't participate, then, you know, I'll have no fucking customers whatsoever. But if, if I said, you know, okay, Hey guys, can we do it at like 5 PM or 6 PM? Then I'll still get fucked and not be able to do the ride, but at least I'll make money in the process. So the, uh, it is a weird thing, but I, so I told Renee, no matter what happens tomorrow, I'm scheduling, uh, uh, a mental, fucking therapy ride for 6 p.m. And um, if customers want to come and give me money to not do it, then I'll, I'll do it. But Phil, I think it's going to rain tomorrow evening. I don't fucking know, man. I don't know, but what? yeah. what's going to be the, what's going to be the weapon of choice, Phil? I don't know. I've, I've got a, so I just put together a new uh, Benelli TNT 135. Oh, I want one of those. I want one of those. I'm selling something to buy one of those. I'm just telling you. Well, but hold on. They just came in today. I just uncreated them. And the one that I just uncreated is the green, the acid green. And it reminds me so much of an old Triumph Speed Triple and that acid green color with like, you know, 
Yeah, yeah. If, you just know the color. If I tell you Triumph Speed Triple Acid Green, you know right. what color I'm talking about. I think and, Triumph call that color Roulette Green. Roulette Green. That's roulette right. Green. Which is funny because it was not the shade of the green on a roulette wheel. No, but it, it wasn't roulette wheels. Roulette wheel. It was Roulette right. Green. Right. But, but the color. Roulette Green, yeah. The Roulette Green, this is an acidic, very obnoxious green color. And I just realized that I have now discovered the perfect color for a TNT 135, and it is Kermit the Frog Acid Green. Yes. Well, that's <laughs> perfect. Yeah. You know, what I would do is go on to a, you know, go down to a local uh, um, sticker place and get yeah. them to do you a cartoon of Kermit smoking a crack pipe. <laughs> Stick it on the gas tank and then it becomes a Cleveland motorcycle shop special <laughs> and you can sell it for a thousand bucks more. <laughs> and that is Deadpool. You made the Deadpool scooter and that Deadpool thing. scooter worked great. I mean, the yeah. The Deadpool thing was fantastic. It worked really well. The uh, And the guy who bought the Deadpool bike was completely into it. And his kids were into it. And it was all just super, it was pretty fucking rad. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just, it's one of those things that as you, when you see a bike, there are certain bikes that look really good in some colors and really bad in other colors. Right. And this is one of those ones. I'm just going to throw it up here real quick for you guys. Uh, this is good. So this is a bike that just looks really good in that. Oh, <laughs> so yeah. In acidic green, which right. is the oh. minority color. Yes. Yeah. I need that. I need they're very like, popular. Yeah, they're it's very popular. like day glow. Yeah, they're very popular in red and very popular in white. But for some reason, the minority color is by far this green color. Oh. But I fucking like it. I it's like really it. cool. Yeah. So I, I need that. I, I might be implied. I might be yeah inclined to ride that. So How much do those run, Phil? What's that? How much do those run? The TNTs. Uh, twenty six ninety nine. So what I like to tell people is it is the exact same price as a Buddy one twenty five with a carburetor. You get a Chinese Italian bike with a fuel injection and uh, you know good brakes and upside down forks and all that shit. Um, is it made in China or Thailandia? No, it's fucking Chinese. Uh, okay. And what's funny about it is I was I was building two of them today. And so there is the Razcol, the Razcol 125. And I've done many Groms and I've worked on lots of Groms. And this Benelli is absolutely, make no mistake, it's, it's Chinese right down to the angle iron metal crate. So like um, people who build bikes will know that the angle iron metal crate is like the kiss of death. This bike is clearly from China, but it is so fucking well thought out. Like the way they put the thing in the crate, the way they set the bike up for shipping, it's got about 300 pieces of hardware holding that thing in place so that it can't be damaged. Um, it's more care goes into the fucking crating of that bike than a lot of other bikes that I've worked on. And it's quite good. And I would be very interesting to see one that has like 50,000 miles on it to see what it looks like after somebody's put a shit ton of miles on it, because it does strike me as being a particularly good bike. Um, I, from my opinion of seeing Groms and thing and sitting on the one in your shop and stuff yeah. and feeling the metal, I'd like to ride it, but I, I really want one because I think it's a Grom. I really think it's a way better bike than a Grom and it'll yeah. beat a Grom and do all the things that a Grom does but better with no modification whatsoever and just leave it the way it is and i think if you just leave it the way it is and you don't fuck with it and you resist the urge to get your fucking dick beaters all over the goddamn thing <laughs> you'll probably have a much better bike than a grom that you've taken and added three thousand dollars worth of shit to right right um, and in any case the grom isn't made in japan and neither is the z125 no, they're all chinese they're yeah, they're all chinese one of them is chinese they're all chinese and so it's like you have to at this point admit that that smell is china and if you want to do these little things you're going to be doing it on a chinese bike and, and right. the difference nowadays so i have a shitty chinese grom clone called yes the grim but it's a cow, cow right. Right. and putting it so you look at you know steve's monkey or or um uh, cam's uh, z125 
Both right. of those bikes are better. They are. Like, you can look at the welds. You can look at the plastic and stuff. My plastic is disintegrating just sitting there. <laughs> For $2,000 less, right. it's way better than you would expect it to be. That's, right. like, that's where they're at now. Like, it really is to that point. But I definitely want that. That's my next purchase from you, Phil. Yeah, they're, they're very well done. The headlights, I mean, like the lighting is exceptional. The build quality everywhere, the choice of hardware is really, really well done. Um, it's just, they just did a fair, they just did a fucking good job with the bike and there's nothing about it that's embarrassing. And um, I just, I recently did one of the new Yamaha SR400s. So um, we just had one of the, 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 I mean, new, so it's a 2019 we just had one come into the shop and the thing had like 500 miles on it and going over the bike, I could tell that this was a, a Yamaha, like kind of a, a Yamaha profit center because that bike has been around for 35 fucking years in one form or another, you know, the SR 500, the right. SR 400, it hasn't changed much. And you can see that they've allowed the manufacturing costs or the, or the kind of the, 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 order of parts or the, you know, the manual of parts on the thing has just gotten allowed to be very, very cheap. And so the fasteners on the bike were really shitty. And a lot of the stuff that was holding things together on the bike wasn't really a good piece of kit. It wasn't a good piece of hardware anymore. It was really a lowest bidder item. And that is from Yamaha, which right. Yamaha has the highest fucking standard of reliability and the highest or uh, the lowest incident of warranty claims. And it's not so, just the fasteners. I mean, when you right. look at that bike, when you go into work tomorrow, just yeah. look at the casting on the back hub. It's right. like, Jesus Christ. It's really shitty. It's yeah. terrible. Yeah. And it's un. so it is proving that there's excellent Yamaha and there's crap Yamaha and there's excellent Chinese and there's crap Chinese. Um, I've got a Harley Davidson right now that I'm working on that there are some certain parts on the bike that I'm just embarrassed about how bad they are. Right. And like the overall castings, the overall workmanship of the part is just junk. I mean, it's, it's just, it was crap before it got put on the bike and it's still crap. So yeah, it's a very strange time we live in where you can no longer make a blanket statement and say like, Oh, this is a German bike. Therefore this, or this is a, right. Scandinavian bike, therefore this. No, it's there. Everybody's been fucking everywhere. Oh yeah. no, Germany's made its share of shitty quality yes, bikes, and um, you know British bikes. Let's go down that rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got a bike that you can't ride across a parking lot without breaking down, but it's got beautiful paint on it. Fucking gorgeous, <laughs> gorgeous paint and chrome. Yeah. But you 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 can't ride it. Because mm -hmm. it'll break down on you. So, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it, where do you go with this? Right. But I agree with you. China will, they will build exactly what you want them to. <laughs> and if you want just the lowest bid, right. cheap out the door, thousand dollar bike they'll build that for you i think it comes down to that that oh you're in tijuana now tijuana, that's yeah, fantastic that's, that's uh yeah that's yes there's oscar's uh, oscar's right back there yeah that's my soggy <laughs> <laughs> okay very good <laughs> yeah he's he's that's that there you go he's crossing the street just got his grocery shopping right there i see him i see him with his <laughs> yeah i see him with his 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 asda bag <laughs> his tesco shopping bag <laughs> <laughs> the uh yep but i i just i i we getting to play with new stuff and getting to play with not so new stuff. Uh, it is kind of an interesting place. I think that if anybody could work in a motorcycle shop for about a month in the peak season and see all the different stuff that comes in on the red, right. you'd be shocked. I mean, it, it really is disturbing um, about, about how bad it is. Does anybody want to see a guy that wants to trade in a Yamaha V star? Uh, Anybody want to see a, a gaze into my world? Yes, I would love so, to. So this is a 2018 V-Star that uh, wants to be traded in desperately. But as you can see, it's a Silverado, which means a Silverado, it would have had everything, right? Right. So a front fender. So, okay, so this guy has customized this bike. Oh, my. Uh, unfortunately and this is this is just a prime example of just like what happens when uh when customization just goes 
there's no skill involved. He just took things away. So he just kept removing things and the Model A taillight on the back, the broom handles, uh, handlebars, and the whole deal. And uh, the, the foot shaped floorboards. Oh, God. Uh, he yeah. probably thinks it's worth an absolute bloody fortune. And so, it? yeah, so this is a, a crazy thing. So, you know, this is a V-Star 650. So a V-Star 650 is not even a full-scale motorcycle. It's like an 80% <laughs> scale motorcycle. Um, it's not meant to be a full-scale motorcycle. It's not, it's for people to learn on. That's the design. That's the idea behind it. Right. And so this guy took this thing, and I'm sure he paid retail for it. And he took the bike, paid retail for it, and then did these horror, like just basically removed parts and kept removing parts and then kept replacing them with things that are from like, you know, if you want your bike to be cool, buy it from us, Springer Saddle. And he wants to trade the bike in because he, he obviously has fallen out of love with it. But in the meantime, there is nothing less valuable right now than a five-year-old japanese v-twin replica cruiser um especially a small displacement one like a 600 or a 650 or something like that these things have no fucking value the price on these things at auction is like damn near free and he's got one that unfortunately has been devalued by him customizing it. So I looked up the numbers and it's like Kelly blue book on the bike. And it's only like three years old. It's like a 2017 or 18. And the Kelly blue book numbers on the bike are only like 3,200 bucks, but the average price they've been selling for at auction has been like 2,100 bucks. Yeah. And his bike won't pull that because it's all been fucking personalized. You know, as soon as I saw that thing, I thought that's a fifteen hundred dollar bike. Exactly. Yeah. And, <laughs> and the worst part is, yeah. everything he's bolted onto that bike, he's paid a lot of money for. Yeah. He he bought that Dime City Cycles back fender and the you know grips and the seat yeah. and everything, and he probably paid good money yeah. for that. Yeah. He probably started with a five thousand dollar. Oh, I'm sorry. He probably started with a seven thousand dollar motorcycle, put three thousand dollars into it, and now he's got a twelve hundred dollar motorcycle. There you go. Yeah, it's it's really bad. It's it's a terrible place to be in because you know I don't want to be an asshole, but on the same token. I can't give the guy anything for the bike because nobody's going to come in and be like, well, oh, that's exactly what I wanted. Here's a top tip from a very, very old time mechanic. So everyone who's listening out there in podcast land, if you want to trade in your bike, the bikes that sell yeah. a stock and really clean condition. And when oh, yeah. I say stock, I mean stock, yeah. stock paint, exactly. stock pipes, yeah. stock everything. The closer to factory it is and the closer to as new condition it is, these are the bikes that sell and right. fetch big money. Yeah. That RF 900 that I tool around on, I've turned down ridiculous yeah. amounts of money for that yeah. because it's stock. Right. There just aren't any left anymore. If you take anything off your motorcycle ever, box it and save it. Yeah. Uh, every bike that we have at the shop that has any amount of custom work done to it, whether it's, it's like that G400 Scrambler we have right. or my V7 Racer that's got a lot of custom stuff done to it. We have cardboard box on the shelf that says V7 Racer and it has every single OEM item in it so that in about an hour and a half, we can take that bike back to factory stock. Right. And you got to do that. And it becomes even more critical as the bike gets older. Yes, it so it, it's, you know, yep. you see ads on Craigslist all the time. Well, it's a $2,000 bike and I put right. $3,000 worth of accessories on it. So I'm only asking five grand. <laughs> I'm like, Dude, you actually took value off yes, your you bike, not added it. And it really is a strange thing too. When you think like if somebody ever said, I know it's going to sound crazy, but we just took in a, a 2000 uh, Ducati. I don't know if you guys saw that little yellow monster. We yellow took in. monster. Yep. So we took this little yellow monster 750 in on trade. And normally I wouldn't do it because it's carbureted. It's not fuel injected. Right. But the fucking thing, it had 9,000 miles on it. It's 20 years old, but it's got the factory pipes on it. 
There's nothing on the bike that isn't factory except for the turn signals. And it was just perfectly kept. And at only 9,000 miles, uh, who you're actually get, you're actually going to do quite well with that. Bike. I think we are. And it's, it's really good, funny because do you guys remember I was talking about the, the K1200 uh, mm-hmm. RS that I got at auction for 1150 bucks. Right. So I got this, you know, beautiful 2000 or 1999 K1200 RS for 1100 and some odd dollars. That's what the guy traded. So the guy traded that baby Ducati, that Ducati 750 monster for the K1200 RS. Okay. And I'm like, it, and no, to be fair, to be fair. To be fair. <laughs> to be fair, darling. <laughs> he traded the, the little Ducati 750 and a pile of cash. Great. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. About that much. <laughs> so, so he's thrilled. He's got a fuel injected 1200 cc highway hammer yeah that'll get him down the road plenty quick and it's a great bike and i've got an adorable yellow ducati that i can't help smiling at every time i see it i'm I'm, I'm gonna tell you right now you're gonna sell that to a girl you're gonna sell that to a girl in her 30s or 40s um she'll Maybe have not been riding bikes very long, but she's going to see it. She's going to see it in that factory fly yellow paint. Yeah. It's a stylish bike. It is. It's a very, it's a really approachable bike. Yeah, the is. thing is with the, with the Gen 1 Monsters, you mm-hmm. see them and you think, oh, that's, that's going to be my friend. Yes, it is. It's like you look at a V1, you know, a Gen 1 VMAX. Right. And you're like, you're going to fuck me up, aren't you? And the VMAX is going, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to fuck you up plenty, asshole. Because that's what VMAXs do. But a monster, yeah, you see, everyone knows. Right. Gen 1 VMAX, he doesn't want to be your friend. No. Mr. Max doesn't want to be one of He's your drunk Irish friend that you go drinking with. And then you have one too many drinks. And the next thing you know, you're brawling in the parking lot. That's right. He's that guy. Yeah. Gen 1 monster. Right. You know, he's, he's your stylish Italian friend. He's, oh, I want to be your friend. I want to be everyone's friend. He's got his arm around you. He's propping you up. He's carrying you home because you've yeah. drunk too much again. And he's putting you to bed. He's your friend. He's, yeah. You know, he's very approachable. That's who that bike is. It's great. Yeah, they're great motorcycles. They really are. And I've had a bunch of, I've had a bunch of the monsters. And it's a funny thing because I, they don't fit me particularly well because of my size. And they were not built for me. Like the no, they weren't. They weren't. And I love them. I, I look ridiculous on them, and I don't quite fit on them. But I do. I do respect how what a good motorcycle that is, and that Ducati's been doing it for twenty five um, years. Now. Unfortunately, it's it it it's an unfortunate fact. You know what was it? Uh, you know when it, it's one of those things. That bike saved Ducati. Yes, absolutely. because absolutely in the in the 90s, Ducati was in a bad place yeah. financially. They were on the ropes. Oh God! And they were literally staggering from day to day. And the monster saved them. When you look at how bad the Ducati Paso was, oh God! And if you if you take a look at the Paso. It was truly the low water mark. It was equivalent to an AMF Harley Davidson as being like, just like, we can't pay our bills. We can't really build you right. what we want to. We have the ability to build amazing race bikes that can do magnificent things, but that's for our race team. You people, you civilians, you're going to get this piece of shit. And that Paso, when it came out, man, it. I just never knew anybody that had a good experience with that bike. And, w- and when you pull them apart, I've done a couple of Paso engines for right. clients because they've got a certain culty appeal yes, now do. because of how they look. Right. Um, and you've got like cylinder bores that aren't properly bored. You know, it's halfway down and then the cross hatching ends and they gouged up. And then weird McCoonies with push-in jets. Yep. You can't get the jets out of the carburetors. 
because they're so cheaply done. It's like Ducati said, well, we want Mikunis on it, but we don't want to pay for Mikunis. So just do us the cheapest ass carburetor you can with push-in jets. Yeah. It's, and there are passages that if they plug, you're never getting them yeah, clear. You can throw it away. The Paso, uh, we've kind of used to, we used to joke about it, Laguna Seca. We would be like on Ducati Island and you'd be on Ducati Island as kind of a special experience. And then the, the guy with the Paso would show up and you'd always be like, eh, yes. really Ducati, the you know? Paso guys here, you know? Um, <laughs> but, so it's, uh, but back to the monster. Yeah, the monster. That monster really and the German market in particular, right. because Germany could not get enough of those things. Yeah. Really? They're really good bikes. And oh God! The, the trick- German market went bananas for the for the very early monsters, the little ones. The yep. it was the right size bike. Yeah. It was for the time. It it really saved their ass. I went out and, and I so- rode this little uh, the seven fifty, and I took it for a blast around the neighborhood. And uh, just like that eight hundred Super Sport that I had, it's the perfect balance of motor. It right. is neither too fast nor pathetic it's a very exciting to ride it's very fun to ride it's very light it's really and light it and sounds it's good even with the factory pipes good. it's got a yeah. nice little thump to it yeah it's a good motorcycle i think it's a good honest motorcycle as long as you remember that you should change the belts because it has the belt driven cams right so you do have to remember that the the belts should be changed every 10 years or every 10,000 miles right uh, and if you do that, I think the bike will be great for you forever. So I'm going to give everyone a Cleveland Motorcycle Podcast top tip. We like that. If you are riding a, uh, uh, a Panigale V4S yes. and you're thinking to yourself, I have reached the absolute pinnacle of motorcycling, right. or certainly your wallet has. Your wallet has. Your, <laughs> your wallet has. Um, and you are demanding a certain amount of respect right. because you are riding a Panigale V4S. And deservedly so. Yes. And somebody pulls up next to you on a 598 Monster. Right. Yeah. Do not look down on them. No. Because that little monster saved you, Caddy, so they could build your bike. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. A buddy of mine years ago had an M600, uh, first gen, you know. Yeah. Ducati. And Just I bargain bucket. That was the first Ducati proper Ducati I ever rode and I rode it around. And of course it wasn't my size. It was for somebody 70% my size. Right. I, think I rode the thing around. He let me borrow it for a day or two. And I was just like, this is just a fucking good motorcycle. It's just a mm-hmm. straight up good bike. And at the time I was running a Honda GT 60, 650 Hawk. So I was a, also a good bike. And I was a daily driver. My daily ride, ride was a GT 650 Hawk. So getting on the Ducati, I was like, Ooh, this is, this is pretty good, you know, and you know, it was 10 years newer than the Hawk, but it was good. It was a good motorcycle. I'm and glad you brought up the Hawk. You want to hear the craziest thing? We never got the Hawk in England. If you imagine, Did you guys get like a 400 Hawk or something. No. Oh. If you were to pull the chain drive off the Hawk. Right. And put a shaft on it. Yeah. And detune it. Yeah. That's what we got. And it was called the Revere. The Revere, right. The Revere, right. The Honda Revere. Yeah. And it was basically a detuned shaft drive Hawk. Okay, all right. Not a bad bike, right. but it ain't the Hawk. No, the Hawk's fucking magical. Yeah. The yeah, it's, 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 it is a bit of a unicorn, yeah. the Hawk. Yeah, Hawks are just too old now. It's, it's hard to find a perfect Hawk just because it's a 1989 bike, you know? So. Right. Yeah, it's, a, it's a difficult thing. So, anybody got anything else? I want to say that it was, a, it was a pleasure having Emma here. Oh, yeah. thank you, darling. And you've, yeah. you've, you've humbled me. Oh, please. I, thank you, God. Thank you for doing that. Listen, I'm, I'm going to be absolutely straight. I, I've, I've said this over and over again. Um, I am neither 
the greatest mechanic in the world. I'm not, I'm not even a good mechanic. I'm a good, solid mechanic. And my knowledge as far as bikes go certainly isn't extraordinary. But the difference is I've just been around for so fucking long. I'm a living link between the mid-70s and now because I never stopped loving these things. Do, do you know CPR? Because I think Michael Fresh is dead. <laughs> 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 but it's it's you know it's i have never ever stopped loving motorcycles from the mid 70s right up to now and you know if you throw enough shit at somebody it's gonna stick so yeah it's like you know in in motorcycle quizzes generally i win quite a bit because you know, i've just accumulated a lot of crap knowledge over the years <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm just, calling him? I wish I met you before. I wish I met you 30 years before. So. Oh, God. I was a wild child then. Good Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on. Let me see. Hold on a second. Yeah, carry on talking, guys. I'm going to... Oh, shit. Wake up. We're doing a podcast, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god dude hey hey in case you were wondering we, we were just all sitting here talking about you sleeping and it was like you were just had your head tilted back and your mouth was open <laughs> he put his dick in your mouth it was pretty cool <laughs> <laughs> that's cool it's all right we'll send you the pictures later. so cool <laughs> <laughs> oh man dude i got nothing else i think we better ride fast and take chances yeah it's not here johnny mackle fresh wait dan's oh. back dan the other day uh, uh, perfect timing that's the fucking button that's the red button Oh, <laughs> my